Okay, I'm gonna go for it. Robbie, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Great stuff, Susan, yeah. I'm just gonna mute you, Alan, right? So yeah, cool. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our web conference, Adapting to COVID-19, Defending the Public Interest in Vaccine and Medical Development. Everyone at Access to Medicines Ireland would like to extend their thanks to our fantastic lineup of speakers and everyone who has joined us today this is, uh, to discuss how we can ensure equitable access to COVID-19 diagnostics, medicines and vaccines. I know we all want to start hearing the experts, but first I want to go over some of the features of the Zoom conference which we are using today. Like many people in the world, we are really trying to adapt to our new virtual environment. So we really hope that this will go along glitch free. During this conference, the speaker's microphone will be the only one that will be on. All other mics will be muted. This is so we don't cause much interference. At the end of each panel, there will be time for question and answers. If you have questions, please write them in the Q&A box, which is available for all participants to see. If you click the Q&A box icon at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to access it there. While we, might, while we may not have time to go through everyone's questions, we will flag questions that uh, as they come in and raise them with the panel during the Q&A session. And the chat box can then be used if people just like to make comments on what is being said. If you cannot make the whole conference, don't worry. It will be recorded and uploaded to our website, www.accesstomedicines.ie by tomorrow, April 8th. We encourage everyone to use the hashtags hashtag AMI live web and hashtag COVID-19. We will see a poll box, you will see a call box come onto your screens in the next few minutes. This will ask you if you want to be added to our mailing list to get more access to medicines related news and hear about our upcoming conferences. So let me introduce the ever fantastic Susan Mitchell, Deputy Editor and Health Editor of The Business Post, who will be our moderator for today. She is an award-winning journalist, well known for her coverage of Ireland's healthcare system, and her reporting has led to several national policy changes in this area. I also have the great honor of introducing Emily O'Reilly, the European Ombudsman, who very graciously gave up her time today to give today's opening address on this very important topic. Emily O'Reilly was first elected as European Ombudsman in July 2013, and has been since re-elected twice. As the European Ombudsman, she investigates maladministration into institutions and the bodies of the European Union. A former journalist, author, and political editor, Ms. O'Reilly has also written three critically acclaimed books on Irish politics and media. So without further ado, allow me to virtually pass the mic over to Ms. Emily O'Reilly. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Good morning, everybody, and let me begin by thanking Access to Medicines Ireland uh, for the invitation to address you today. No one could have imagined that this conference would be taking place during a global pandemic, as the world looks to the scientific and medical communities for a way back to our normal lives and for an end to the suffering of increasing numbers of people. Your work speaks directly to this crisis. Issues including research capacity, access, funding, data sharing, clinical trials and pricing in the development and rolling out of new therapies, medicines and vaccines come or will come sharply into focus, revealing the extent to which control in the public interest is exerted over matters that will determine the ultimate human cost of this pandemic. Inequalities, as we see, are already laid bare Families with no access to outdoor space, senior citizens exposed in nursing homes, poor and low skilled workers compelled to work in unsafe environments, refugees and asylum seekers unable to move to safety. How will these inequalities play out if and when the vaccines and treatments arrive? Will health be viewed as a commodity or as a public good? Will political leaders recognize that national self-interest is best served through global collaboration? The Trump administration is reportedly attempting to buy its way to the top of the queue for vaccines, with a recent effort made to attract a German pharmaceutical firm to produce vaccine for its exclusive use, while reports of the effect of piracy of essential medical supplies around the world are also growing. The Western world also paid attention to the development of a cure or treatment for a mass infection in the 1980s, when the HIV epidemic took hold. At that time, and for many years afterwards, AIDS was a death sentence. 
Mm. I knew several young Irishmen who died of the disease, but later many others were lucky enough eventually to receive the antiretroviral therapy that would save their lives. But the AIDS ep epidemic did not end there. In 2018, just two years ago, over three quarters of a million people died of HIV related causes globally, 61% in Africa. Dedicated work has nonetheless brought the global figure significantly down and mortality in Africa has also dropped by almost 40% since 2010. But the gap between the developed and the developing world is clear when it came to the provision of life-saving medicines. The history of that time is also instructive vis-a-vis -vis research funding, access, pharmaceutical and scientific rivalries, the extent to which governments do or do not exercise control over the development and rollout of therapy and treatments, and who ultimately gets them. The world is now in full panic mode, with governments galvanized to find an end to an unprecedented crisis. People hope a strike by the coronavirus at the epicenter of the world's largest economies will make the search for a vaccine or for effective treatments move very fast indeed. The capacity of governments to take extraordinary measures, if they choose to, is also clear. From the US administration ordering car manufacturers to produce medical devices, to the enforcement of highly restrictive lockdowns on citizens everywhere. The extent, the extent to which those governments will use their powers positively to intervene in the pharmaceutical and other relevant private industries to ensure optimal outcomes will be an important marker of how this situation is managed and hopefully resolved. This is, of course, a unique situation, visible to all and with fewer hiding places for poor or unethical decision-making by governments and by industry. People are normally unaware of access issues, apart from times when a public plea is made for access to a drug judged either too experimental or too costly. Awareness is also raised when a medicine is found to cause harm and a subsequent trail of deception is unearthed. As European Ombudsman, I monitor the EU institutions and agencies, including the regulatory European Medicines Agency. And I commend that agency for the accessible and useful information it is currently providing about the pandemic and about the development of possible treatments and vaccines. Emma will approve any future vaccines in Europe, an enormous task given the tensions between the world's desperate need for a vaccine and Emma's mm -hmm. fundamental duty to ensure the safety of any such vaccine. The biggest issue I deal with concerning Emma is the transparency of the medicines data that it holds. When the Ombudsman first inquired into the transparency of Emma in 2007, Emma was a black box. It did not make publicly available all the information it had relating to the approval and monitoring process, citing the commercial interests of the pharmaceutical companies and data protection rules. Our work, combined with pressure from the European Parliament, led Emma to change its entire policy. It now makes public all documentation relating to the approval of drugs, with the sole exception of the personal data of patients, and despite significant pushback from the pharmaceutical industry. I've also looked at the approval process. I recently, for example, received a complaint from an Irish citizen whose infant son suffers from a rare variant of cystic fibrosis. He believes that an as yet unapproved drug for children will help his son. My inquiry seeks to find out if Emma has dealt with the evaluation as quickly as possible, given that Emma must satisfy itself that this medicine is safe and effective in children. That inquiry is of obvious importance for the child concerned and his family, especially as cystic fibrosis patients are particularly threatened by the COVID-19 pandemic. It also has resonances for future vaccine approval. Emma will be asked to conduct the approval processes as quickly as possible, while trying to ensure that the approval process is scientifically and medically sound. Vaccines are sensitive. Too weak an immune response provoked and they will not be effective, too strong and the illness may become even worse. Proof of safety and effectiveness will be shown only by complete and extensive clinical trials, which will take time. When hopefully the vaccines do come on stream, the public will trust the approval process and the uptake of these vaccines will create necessary levels of immunity. 
The transparency of the approval process is therefore vital to building that necessary trust. Health authorities will be under great pressure to act swiftly. They may be willing to pay any price for hope, but that carries a risk of ineffective outcomes, even abuses. The more eyes on the decision-making, therefore, the better. History will look back on the actions we take today, and it will judge harshly those that did not base their decisions on sound principles in the public interest. I commend the important work of Access to Medicines Ireland, and I thank you again for inviting me to be part of today's very important conference. Thank you. Emily, thank you very much. Um, that was a really excellent uh, speech. And also thanks very much for the work that your office has done in actually ensuring that Emma has become so much more transparent in recent years, because obviously I think it's something that most people who have tuned in to this uh, conference today feel very passionately about. So thank you. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Um, now, after um, Emily's excellent speech, I wanted to let people know that we now have a panel uh, coming on board, a really excellent panel, and some of you will know these names. We have Professor Sam McConkey, a Professor of Infectious Diseases at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, who is going to discuss COVID-19 treatments that are on the horizon. Uh, Professor Luke O'Neill, who, um, who works at the, or who is based at the School of Immunology in Trinity College. He will be discussing a frenzy of activity, the vaccines, antibodies, antivirals, and anti-inflammatories anti -inflammatories that doctors, researchers, and scientists are looking at to crack COVID-19. I'm also hoping he might touch a little bit on the hope that the BCG vaccine holds out, um, because I know that there's a number of studies being carried out into that and the possible protective uh, measures that that might, uh, might generate for people. We also have Dr. Andrew Hill of the University of Liverpool, who's going to discuss drug shortages during the COVID crisis that are already existing and, and, and may worsen. And finally, Dr. Ellen Doan, um, who works at the Med School of Medicine and Legal Policy in the States. And she's going to discuss learning from the past. So what we can learn from previous outbreaks and epidemics. Um, so they will all talk for about five or 10 minutes each. And after that, we're going to open it up um, to the floor and I will be taking questions from all of you in the audience. So I'd like to firstly welcome Sam McConkie. Sam, if you would take the camera. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Um, is, is the sound working OK? You're hearing me? That's yes, great. I am indeed. Perfect. Thanks. I was, I I was are hoping... Are you in your scrubs? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a regular yeah, hospital doctor. <laughs> I, I, um, I was hoping to welcome you all this morning to our beautiful new lecture theatre in RCSI on York Street. And that, that was the original plan. It, it's uh, sad that this is, this is where we're at, but the, the world has changed. So uh, I guess I, I, I'm an RCSI uh, staff member and professor, and we're, we're one of the co-organizers of, of this conference. Um, I, I've um, been watching this uh, COVID-19 very, very closely in, in Wuhan and Hubei uh, since January, and essentially looking at the what the Chinese government at provincial level and national level have been saying about the outbreak uh, since January, often in Chinese and trying to back translate it and then modeling the numbers. And once it was clear that this spread outside of China and started to spread with the, in the communities in many other countries, then on, on, unfortunately it became clear that this was going to be a, a really worldwide pandemic of completely unusual uh, proportions as, as we're seeing. So what I'd like to talk about documents is really looking at the, the, the scientific ways forward in terms of uh, treatments and preventions. The, the quickest way to develop a, an effective scientific intervention for something is to reprofile an, an existing registered medicine. And we've all probably seen uh, Didier Rault is a very experienced uh, parasitologist from Marseille. He's now a bit like uh, Asterix and Obelix uh, promoting hydroxychloroquine and has decided that maybe hydroxychloroquine works. Apparently he's got 122 people who've, who've taken it and they've all done fine. 
there isn't really a good control group and there's so much variability in this disease that in my view you can't really make any conclusion from 122 cases where, the, where there's no control so I, I that, that's a hypothesis at this stage of course a hopeful one I've used it a lot of course for malaria and I've taken it myself for many years to prevent malaria it's widely used for rheumatoid diseases so it would be fantastically simple if that worked uh, it, it, might, it might be just too simple to be true. Uh, other drugs that are being considered, uh, the angiotensin receptor blocking enzymes, block the protein on human cells and pneumatocytes that the virus used to gain entry. And there's some trials going on at, at looking at, at, at reprofiling uh, the angiotensin receptor block, blocking uh, drugs. Then on the shelf, many of the drug companies, a bit like to take the H HIV analogy that uh, Emily mentioned, uh, AZT, as the Dovidine, was the first drug that Glaxo applied for, for uh, HIV. They had it on the shelf as an anti-cancer drug. It was already manufactured. There was some basic toxicity, some basic animal PK studies, and then it was rapidly used for HIV. Of course, as we know from the Dallas Buyers Club, initially at the wrong dose, and it had a lot of toxicity, and it certainly isn't a drug we use very much anymore. But that first study in the Lancet that showed three months prolonged survival using AZT monotherapy brought great hope and great positive research in antiviral drugs to bear for, for HIV. So I, I, I feel that by using something on the shelf, and of course, Gilead now have remdesivir, which they've had ready for, for, for Ebola and MERS. They're scaling up production and scaling up clinical trials in Japan and, and Europe and China for this. So I'm hoping that that unlicensed drug, but already developed drug may work. Uh, it looks like it inhibits the antiviral enzymes, so it, it may work. The third possibility is to develop new products. Unfortunately, there you're really looking at a three, five, seven year product development lifespan to, to take something from basic chemistry uh, into uh, production and then into clinical trials in animals and then in animal model and then, and then into humans. So, so that may be where we're at. It may be that you know, like HIV, it was from 1981, we discovered the thing, the clinical syndrome, and it was only in, in 1995, that's 14 years later, that we really had effective therapies. So we, we could be looking at a long haul here. On, on uh, The drugs can be used for three things. One is prevention. So many of us are frontline healthcare workers, so taking something like PEP or PrEP equivalent would be great. Number two, an antiviral that prevents the virus replicating. So people who are at the early stage can... Uh, abort the severe, horrible consequences of intensive care and respiratory failure. And then third, of course, treatment for those people with ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome, which is more of an inflammatory cascade that destroys the lungs and causes protein and fluid and uh, to, to move into the lungs. So that's a, a different class of therapies. Uh, I'll briefly mention vaccines because I've I spent a lot of my life developing them. Uh, the typical vaccine cycle in humans for, from concept to, to product is seven to 10 years. In the animal world, it's about three to five years. So when they cut the sort of corners and uh, have to make a vaccine for something in, in dogs or cats or sheep, it, it, you're looking at a three-year-ish product cycle to develop the product, prove it works, and then distribute it, market it, regulate it. So again, I suppose I'm pessimistic that we're going to have a solution to this technically in the next three to six months. I think we're looking at two, three years uh, for, for a possible vaccine. If we move away from the sort of technologies then and look at the, the, the bigger picture, who's sponsoring this? Some things like BCG, of course, are uh, not so much patentable. Uh, they're older and they're around for years. So a lot of those trials are investigator initiated, either funded by public money, by Bill Gates, by WHO, or by investigators. Of course, the uh, remdesivir is a Gilead product. So their Gilead are, are sponsoring uh, that trial. And of course, they have a track record, if you like, of making some of the best HIV drugs that we have. We use a lot of them and they're great. And also they, they bought over Pharmacet and, and uh, brought to market Sofosbuvir. So um, now they have also a reputation, I think it's fair to say, of, of charging an awful lot of money. And Sofosbuvir came on the market at something like $60,000 per person per cure, which is an outrageous amount of money for, for most people in the, in the world. So we're left with this challenge of, of drugs that are effective and work and safe, but but which people can't afford. So uh, there are. This is partly why we're enthusiastic about this conference idea that we need to look at new ways of distributing drugs and rewarding the people who develop them in an equitable way. So it's not just sort of a winner takes all, uh, winner at the end. I would broaden the research to learning about behaviour. How do we help people to? wash their hands to stay isolated? How do we help hospitals and nursing homes to prevent transmission? 
what do we need to do to prevent asymptomatic spread and pre-symptomatic spread? So there's a lot of medical research uh, going on. And that, of course, involves distribution of products like gowns and gloves and masks and so on. So um, I'm uh, happy to leave it at that and take questions on the panel. I will say thank you for the privilege to speak here. Uh, and I'm sorry we're not in RCSI. And, and, Great. Uh, we're Great. A, and and really actually, Sam, space. just just to say, actually, the plan is just for, for all of the, um, the speakers to deliver very short speeches and then to have a panel discussion where we'll we'll then take um, take questions from the floor, if that's OK, if that's OK with you. Um, great. Th th thank you for that. Um, so look, after um, and, and, and thanks for that, Sam. After that, um, I just want to see if, if Luke, if Professor Luke yep. O'Neill is um, has joined hi, us. I'm indeed, Susan. Yeah, can you hear me? Great. Hi. Yep. How are you? Hi there. This is going very smoothly so so far. It's going so. great. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Absolutely. So look, fi fire ahead. Grant, thank you very much, Susan. A big thanks sure. for Kieran for inviting me. What a fantastic topic, and um, I'm delighted to take part. We keep getting asked the question: If a drug comes along, who can who can afford it, and who will get it? You know. And my job really in one way is to tell people what's going to be coming down the track in terms of science. But of course, the big question is who will get access and people keep asking me. So I'd love to see what's going to happen this morning in our discussion. Now, I think the second thing I'd say is there's a massive spotlight being shone on everybody right now. Politicians, first and foremost. There was a great economist article six weeks ago saying this virus will test every political system. And that's what's happening. Secondly, of course, our healthcare workers, they're our first concern and we must support them and they're all and we've, everybody says this and it's, it's becoming a, a truism they do a fantastic a big spotlight on them and the pressure they're under the scientists of course are being scrutinized uh, mainly because stupid studies are being published <laughs> which must be looked at uh, the rules of engagement have changed a lot of a lot of pre-published stuff is coming out unrefereed and that's a concern to us all now this can be justified because it's an emergency but equally the standards of rigor in science are not being met in many of these studies, so the scientists are being looked at. What scientists are saying is being looked at, including myself and Sam, we're always being asked, aren't we, Sam? Um, and it's difficult for us, you know, because there's no definitive answers, and scientists just give probabilities in the end, and, and of course, people don't want to hear that. They want a clear answer, and, that, and then, of course, us scientists are, are, are being watched because, you know, people want, and we all want clear answers, but it's a real challenge for us as well. And then, of course, the drug discovery business. I think this is the biggest spotlight ever shone on pharma, I suspect the pharma sector will change radically as a result of this. And I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. Um, so really the spotlight's on everybody and the world we will emerge from after this is over will be a different world for definite. And in the case of pharma and biotech and drug pricing, this has to be a good development, I bet you. Now, Sam did a great job on, it, on um, telling you the various approaches. You've all heard them in spades, I guess. Um, I might just give two or three examples myself. So let's start with BCG, Susan. That, that's, um, around at the moment. Now, I've worked on BCG for donkey's years. If you're an immunologist, this is bread and butter because it's a fantastically powerful immunostimulant. It was the vaccine for TB, of course, and still is in many countries. Uh, Dorothy Stockford Price, I always mention her, she brought that to Ireland in the late 40s and saved millions of lives effectively. And, the, and would you believe the HSE of the day didn't want this brought to Ireland for various reasons? Anyway, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. very strange. Um, anyway, Dorothy, does there, she, there should be statues to her all over Ireland. Anyway, it, it turns out it was good for childhood TB. Uh, millions and millions of people have had it. Now, there have been a literature uh, that began about 30 years ago, actually, where clever physicians noticed that people who had BCG were protected against measles of all things. And then malaria cropped up. And the next thing were respiratory diseases. These were somewhat anecdotal. Um, in the past 10 to 15 years, that's got much better. This vaccine protects against other infections. It does it by boosting what's called innate immunity, which is my bread and butter, actually. It puts up a barrier that repels many germs, it turns out. Now, that has provoked seven separate trials running right now, and it's a fascination. There's, there's one in, in Holland, a friend of mine, Mihai Nate, is leading that one. Uh, there's one in Australia with healthcare workers. There's one in Germany with elderly people. So we're going to see now, again, it adds to the mix. You know, there's many trials running with many different things. This, this trial, these trials have begun. And then last week, um, two papers came out suggesting an association between BCG usage in countries and a lower rate of death. Both of those papers had many flaws. Uh, there were confounding variables, but there was a trend there that got our attention, especially given the, the BCG studies anyway and the science behind BCG. It really got my attention. We know the mechanism of how this BCG works, by the way. It causes what's called epigenetic reprogramming. Won't go into the details. 
Now, and then yesterday, a Johns Hopkins group published a third paper showing the association. That's how much, that's the strongest paper of the three so far. They acknowledge the confounding variables and so on. So, so there's something going on here with BCG. And we see that as a bridge to a vaccine because this will not be a specific vaccine. It won't, you know, it isn't against, you know, SARS-CoV-2, but it could provide a non-specific boost that will protect you against, um, against, uh, against COVID-19. And I'm getting loads of emails, Susan. I had three this morning about this, right? Wow. Very clever guy who worked for UNICEF and the WHO for years on the BCG vaccine. Can you put a guy in his 70s email? And he says, I believe in this. He says, that's the first thing, right? The second thing he said was in Ireland, he said, maybe there's more deaths in the North because they stopped vaccinating with BCG. And it could be about the kids. It's not about the adults. How would someone in their 70s be protected with the vaccine that was given to them 50 years ago? It could be the kids are getting vaccinated and they're protected and they aren't spreading it to old people. That's a possibility. So we're now looking at the possible mechanisms that may or may not be true. Remember, anybody listening in, this is very experimental. If you've had the vaccine, you aren't necessarily protected. That's really important. Keep washing your hands, keep the hygiene. It's another scientific idea that's being explored. And we add to the mix that Sam mentioned. And it's great to have as many shots on goal as possible. So that's the BCG one. Now I've only got five minutes, which is a physical impossibility for me. So <laughs> Um, there's two other things I want to mention about the drug pricing thing that's intriguing, in my opinion. So J&J &J are out front with the vaccine development. There are 41 companies developing vaccines as we speak. Great promise, great hope. We really believe it will work. That's 99% of immunologists say there's hope with this virus. It'll take a year and a half at a minimum, as Sam mentioned. I know guys who've worked on malaria for 30 years and never got a vaccine, okay? HIV still won't yield, you know? although there may be hints of both of those yielding, but it's a very difficult business. Now, 41 companies, good God, let's hope one of them works, right? J&J &J are putting $500 million in themselves. The US government are matching that. And the CEO of J&J &J said it will be a free vaccine. Now, this is interesting. It's partly, it has to be set up. Be set up. Secondly, Secondly um, um, hello? Yeah, you seem to be back actually, Luke, you're back. Oh yeah, Morgan anyhow. came up there for some reason. <laughs> um, so, so J and J, very interesting. They've said it'll make it free. Let's start with that, okay? Uh, Gilead, as as Sam has mentioned, they have been um, in trouble over the hepatitis C drug that worked, of course, in great effect for hepatitis C, fantastic. But there was a very high price, uh, and that that can be discussed, I suppose. What was that justified? Because health economics comes into this as well. Remember, and all those questions. Anyway, they have the antiviral remdesivir. Uh, if that works, that will be a massive contribution. Again, there's questions around it. Uh, trials are running as we speak. We've known about four weeks, by the way, because it's a pretty quick trial to run. Optimism, it works in a test tube. Many things don't work from the test tube into the human. So we need to, again, again, wait for the double blind placebo control trial. And there's loads running with remdesivir, there's optimism. That will be the big one because that will lower the viral count massively in people, and that's what we want. So now the question is again, who will pay for it? And can they make enough of it? And those are the questions coming mm -hmm. to them. They stumbled Gilead, as you probably all know, that they went for orphan status and then they withdrew the request, which was really bad PR actually. So we'll see what's gonna happen with that. But anyway, fair play to them. They've got a drug and, and it worked in Ebola, you know? So let's see what happens with, uh, with that one. And I think then in the meantime, then I wanna finish with hydroxychloroquine. That's getting worse in my opinion, Sam. Um, and, and remember, we all like the look of that because and I, I worked on chloroquine as well back in the 80s. It is an anti-inflammatory. We, we were involved in some of the anti-inflammatory properties of that molecule. There had been some evidence it was antiviral as well. Uh, would you believe the 1918 flu pandemic, the number one thing was quinine and it, they killed people with the wrong dose. This is incredible. And hydroxychloroquine is a safer version of quinine. Um, so there was this stuff about antiviral things. This guy, Raoul, I mean, they called him get a fix, by the way, from... Um, from uh, <laughs> He's not Obelix, he's getting it. Um, he seems to be a radical. Now that trial was really, it was interesting. It was open label, which can be justified by the way in an emergency. You can do an open label trial on cancer. There's flaws in that trial. There's no doubt about that. The big concern I would have about hydroxychloroquine is side effects. And there's anecdotal stuff online where a, a trial in Paris, 30% of the people given that drug had, an, a, a, had a, a dysfunctional dysrhythmias in their heart. Now, what's happening there is this is a COVID-19 population. It's not normal people. It's not like some with lupus, where it's approved, by the way, or arthritis. COVID-19 affects the heart. If you put a drug into someone that's potentially cardiotoxic, who's, who's surprised to see possible ill effects? So now, th now that doesn't take away from all the trials. They're, they know about this. And in fact, in, in the Rao trial, they, have, they measured people's heart function during the trial. So he's not stupid, is he? Um, lots of trials are running, including in Ireland, by the way. Ireland's joined the network. 
to examine hydroxychloroquine and let's see what happens. They won't harm people, hopefully. Um, we need a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It is justified to do the trial as long as it's carefully monitored. But, but these worries are there with that drug. And I, I think, and we don't want to mention the Trump guy, do we? That's my head goes into my hands whenever he opens his mouth. If I was in America and a scientist, I'd be hanging my head in shame. So we got to be very careful here, you know. But yet again, it's a shot on goal. Let's see what happens. And of course, the other thing is, Susan, that's worth mentioning. He's a hero in France because it's anti-big pharma in a way. It's, it's a drug that's cheap as chips, remember. You can get it off the shelf. It's not some fancy remdesivir, is it? Right. His work on, on chloroquine is kind of seen as, you know, the gilet jaune angle on this in a way. He's, he's on the cover of Paris Match, you know. And again, you got to watch that. I hate seeing that. We don't want scientists on the cover of popular magazines. It's the worst thing in the world, right? So, so we got to watch this carefully. Still, I'd finish with one last comment. I sent the thing around last night. There are 41 vaccines being tested, 23 anti-inflammatories as we speak in trials, you know, which will stop the damage of this thing. And then I think it's six antivirals, I think in total at the moment, are all rushing forward. Let's not lose our scientific rigor and the standards we have to apply scientifically. You can take shortcuts a little bit, it's an emergency, but you've got to apply the bog standards that we have for drug discovery and vaccine development. And it's all about safety and efficacy. And in terms of the timeline, um, my optimism is remdesivir. If that works, it'll be available in the next three months, maybe. The second thing is antibody therapy. Didn't mention those. They're looking very promising as well. That could be September. If, if the BCG trials read out, and they will be reading out in the next three months or so, that could be a massive contribution because now everybody gets the BCG, you see. So in other words, we, we remain optimistic and we keep applying the scientific rigor to ensure science is done properly in this disease. Great, thank you very much, um, Luke. That, that, that was really excellent. And just to keep people, um, to keep viewers, listeners in the loop, for those of you who might've just joined us, um, we just had Professor Sam McConkey, um, an infectious disease specialist, talking uh, before Professor Luke O'Neill of the School of Immunology at Trinity College Dublin. We're going to have another two, two speakers, um, Dr. Andrew Hill at the University of Liverpool, who's going to talk about drug shortages and COVID-19, and also Dr. Uh, Dr. Ellen Doan, who um, is a passionate advocate of for, or I should say, for access to medicines and has a keen interest in intellectual property. So we're going to have Andrew will speak for about um, five minutes. And after that, we will have Dr. Doan. Um, and then I'm going to open up to the panel for a discussion um, and, you know, on the various uh, topics that our speakers have touched on. And we'd also love to get questions from you in the audience. So I'll pass over to you, um, Andrew, Dr. Hill, if you would now uh, take, take to the camera if you're there. Okay, can you, can you see the slides? Actually, I can, that's very impressive, yeah. <laughs> Wonders of modern technology. Okay, so as the last two speakers have been saying, We've got probably 18 months where we're almost certainly not going to have a vaccine and we're relying on antiviral drugs, drugs to maybe prevent the infection, uh, drugs to treat the symptoms. And my team in the past, we've looked at how much it costs to make a whole range of drugs. We've worked with the World Health Organization on the essential medicines list. We've looked at hepatitis C, at cancer, tuberculosis, and we've basically applied the same methods for all these treatments that have been used for other indications, but they've been what's called repurposed for coronavirus. So they're, they're, we're just trying them out. It's an experimental phase. And if you look at the structure of some of these drugs, you look at remdesivir, favipiravir, lopinavir, ritonavir, there's a whole list of them. And they're basically, they're quite simple molecules with established methods of synthesis. People have made them um, for many years in some cases. So we have a database called um, Pangeva, where we can look at the import and export of these drugs all over the world. We can see where they're made. We can see how much a kilogram of what's called API costs. Now, API is called, it means active pharmaceutical ingredient. So it's a kilogram of the raw drug before it's turned into a formulated medicine. Um, where we don't have that, we can look at the published routes of synthesis. We've got a, molecular, a professor of molecular chemistry who can estimate cost of, of API production. So we can look at how much the drugs cost to make versus the, um, the published prices in the British National Formula in the US drug lists, et cetera. The, by the way, this is all confidential. This is going to be published on Friday. So I'm just presenting you ahead okay. of the game. Um, okay, so let's look at remdesivir, for example. So 
Our, our professor of molecular chemistry has estimated that a kilogram of remdesivir can be made for 4,000 US dollars. It's actually going to come down to 2,000 with upscale, but we're being, being conservative with these prices. So to, to treat somebody for 10 days, you basically need 1.1 grams of remdesivir, which would cost $4.40 uh, when produced at scale. You then have to um, put in various factors. You have to look at um, the, the loss of drug substance during the formulation. You have to put it in an ampule. And then you've basically got the, the cost of formulating the drug and then a profit margin, uh, taxation, transport costs. But basically the cost of remdesivir is approximately nine US dollars if produced to the same scale as drugs used um, for global access programs, TB drugs, malaria drugs, HIV drugs. You're talking of hundreds of thousands of doses, which is what we'd need. Um, so you've got $9 for remdesivir. Then you've got favipiravir, this drug from Fujifilm in Japan. Uh, it's a very simple molecule. We've estimated $1,000 per kilo, but it's probably going to be far less than that. So again, a, a, a kilo, uh, if a kilo costs $1,000, a 14-day course um, costs $16.80. And then once you've put in the cost of formulation and, and um profit margins, you're talking $20 for 14 days of treatment. Now we've then looked at all the other drugs that are hydroxychloroquine. I mean, this is fundamentally a cheap drug. It's, it's, it's over 60 years old. But um, if you look at the, uh, the prices in various countries, what, you, what you'll see in these graphs is that US pays the most out of anybody, almost for anything. And then the generic prices are on the bottom right hand corner. So I'll just move that. Um, so you can see uh, a 14 day course of hydroxychloroquine, one US dollar, um, and it's being sold for higher prices. So you then got chloroquine, it's, about, it's just incredibly cheap to make. Um, it's probably cost more for the bottle than for the pills. Um, um, so then you've got azithromycin, this um, antibiotic used with hydroxychloroquine in the French study. Um, again, it's, it's incredibly cheap to make. Uh, and then you've got lapinavir, autonomy, the Kalitra that's been used and had quite disappointing results in the early pilot studies. A two week course of Kalitra costs four US dollars. It's available through the Gold Global Fund for nine US dollars. And the same drugs being uh, sold in the US for 350 to $500. Then you've got sofosfibir, it's being tested in Iran and um, Uruguay in two pilot studies, encouraging results from the first studies in, in Iran. Um, now that costs uh, to the through the VA system, the Veteran Affairs in the US, eighteen thousand six hundred dollars for a five dollar drug. It's available in Pakistan for six, India for seven, Bangladesh for one six six. Perfenidone. Now this is a, a drug used for people already with pulmonary symptoms. Um, it's a drug normally for pulmonary fibrosis. Um, Nine thousand six hundred US pharmacies, and it's a thirty one dollar drug to make. A hundred dollars in India. Um, Focalizumab, this is the one drug that's, that's still expensive. We're, we're still working on the cost of synthesis for this one, but it's uh, in the US it's 3,300 versus a $500 injection in Pakistan. So you can see all the prices here and basically you get the same trend that these drugs are incredibly cheap to make and you could mass produce them for basically a dollar a day for anything, except for tocolizumab, which is a monoclonal, but we, we can get the price down for that to probably about 100 US dollars per injection. So just to summarize, if these trials work, and we've got to, we've got to remember there's a big if here, we don't know if, if which of these treatments is gonna prove successful, we might need a combination, but we, we can aim for a target price of approximately one US dollar per person per day, and often much less, and that includes remdesivir. For remdesivir, the cost of the saline is gonna cost more than the actual drug. It's that cheap. So if these drugs are effective, they could be mass produced so that anyone with coronavirus in any country could afford them. We've already got mechanisms for ensuring access. We could follow a similar model to either the Global Fund or PEPFAR, which have already shown how mass treatment for HIV and TB and malaria is feasible with drugs sold close to the cost of production to treat millions of people. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, can I just double check that Dr. Doan has, has joined us? I have. Great. 
I'm not seeing you come up on the uh, the video cam just yet, but I see myself. Uh, I, I see you me. now. I see you yeah. now. And okay, can good. I just double check, Doctor Doan, because it's not on the um, on, on the literature. But is it? Um, are you are you based in France or the Netherlands at the moment? I'm at the moment. I'm in France. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I'm so far from Marseille, actually. So I <laughs> see all. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for um, for inviting me. Thank you, Access to Medicines uh, Ireland. Um, I would have, of course, preferred to meet you all again in in person and and go out for a pint later this afternoon. <laughs> but I guess that's going to have to wait some other time. Um, a, a lot of what I meant to share with you today has already been said. So I'm going to try to be. Um, to be brief and focus a little bit on what possible approaches could be for the challenges ahead of us should vaccines um, and, and, and medicines proven to be effective that are currently under, uh, under development. Because of course that is what we would like to see. We want effective treatments and we want effective vaccines available at affordable prices so they can be used um, in all countries uh, concerned all over the planet. Now, the likelihood of that happening automatically is close to zero. And I say this based on about 30 years of experience working on these issues in other disease areas. And already in the last few weeks, we've seen a few moves um, from, from companies that were, were unhelpful uh, to say to say the least, uh, Gilead, probably under pressure of its uh, of its investors, the investment bankers have have urged the uh, executives of the drug companies to develop strategies to um, to profit from this uh, from this crisis. Gilead leadership pushed back, but also at the same time applied for an orphan drug um, designation. So that did not look very good. They've rescinded that since, which is good, but not after quite a bit of pressure. In my home country, um, the Netherlands, there's been a, a huge conflict between Roche and the government when Roche could not deliver enough um, of, 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 a, of, of a substance needed in its testing machines, um, hampering the rollout of the testing for COVID-19. Um, pharmacists in principle could make that fluid, but Roche did not want to disclose the formula and the technical specifications to make sure that it could be used in in its machines that required huge political pressure to force them to disclose that information. They did in the end. Um, we've heard about Johnson & Johnson, who's developing a vaccine. They're very optimistic. As head of, head of research announced that it will be available early next, uh, next year's year. Remains to be seen, but he also announced a price of 10 euros per vaccine. If that is indeed what they plan to do, then most that this may sound okay for us. I have 10 euros in my in my wallet, but for most of the people in the developing world, that means no access. And of course, in a fighting a pandemic, while only giving access to the most important tool to a few countries won't do a great uh, won't do a great deal. Um, we've also seen governments respond to some of these issues, particularly the issues related to the intellectual property barriers. Um, Countries have been quite, some countries have been quite swift in amending its national legislation, its national patent law, to enable swift use of compulsory licensing. That is a legal mechanism that lifts the monopoly effect of a, of a patent that could potentially be important for uh, remdis remdesivir. Uh, patent expiry dates are quite far in the future for, those, for that compound. Um, Israel already has issued a compulsory license for lopinavir ritonavir. Um, patents are held by APFI, and it's interesting that the day after that, APFI dropped its patents globally for all indications, including for HIV. So these compounds are now in the public domain. So these are developments that those of us who work in the HIV uh, world, those were long you know, battles that took, took months and, and we see now in days responses. So uh, we can take a little bit of comfort for that because it's good to see governments act, but mm -hmm. this approach, which is case by case, country by country, is not going to be um, is not going to be the um, the answer, and there are some lessons that we can learn, of course, uh, from from HIV, particularly what not to do. 
um, in the developing world, medicines to treat, to treat HIV and AIDS did not become available until 10 years after they had become available in the North. Um, the medicines patent pool played a Im very important role to make sure that generic low cost medicines could be made available on a very large scale, but it took 10 years to, um, to establish. Now, what we see today is enormous public sector investment in the development of these of, of the of, of, of medicines and particularly of of vaccines and other tools that will be necessary to to uh, to respond to this pandemic that also offers options to attach conditions to that financing because in fact these technologies currently under development need to be they can't go to market in the business as usual model we need a, a new way of doing that we need new norms that established that these technologies and these tools are are public global goods that's what that that is absolutely key we need mechanisms to make that happen two weeks ago um, this is why costa rica made a proposal to the world health organization to establish an international COVID pool a place where intellectual property data knowledge know-how technology software you name it can be shared for everyone to use to make sure that that cannot become the propriety um, uh, uh, propriety to one country or to, to one or a few uh, cooperation. This proposal is gaining very rapid, significant support. The medicines patent pool has expanded its mandate uh, so it can work on COVID-19 globally. Unitate, an important financing mechanism in global health, has freed up resources for such innovative, um, for innovative approaches and have informed Dr. Tedros from the WHO that they're willing to help make this, um, make this happen. The pharmaceutical industry is beginning to make cautious, positive noises, which is, which is of course important because initially this would, this would work on a voluntary basis. So all the stars are, are aligned. Um, what is needed is more governments speaking out in favor of this and supporting WHO in making that happen. While it is understandable that governments today are focused on domestic needs, they also need to come out of their somewhat nationalistic shell and in, endorse uh, global initiatives and global approaches because no country can do this um, on, on its own. This pandemic can only be overcome if all work together if all will benefit from the new tools, from the new vaccines and medicines currently being developed. And as I said, for that, we will need new norms. COVID-19 tools need to be global public goods. The IP knowledge know-how needs to be shared, and that needs to be reflected in the conditions for funding of research that is currently being spent on these new tools. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Doe, and thank you for that. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, we're now going to, <clears throat> excuse me, open up to a panel discussion. I know some people have sent in some questions. We'll have that discussion for approximately uh, 30 minutes and then have a little break before we return to our, our, our second session of this morning. But for, first off, um, I, I, I believe that Dr. Ruth Freeman, who is Director of Science uh, for Society um, at the SFI, is, um, has joined us and has a question. So if I could ask you, Dr. Freeman, to, to put your question to the panel. Thanks so much, uh, Susan. Nice to see everyone today. It's been a really interesting discussion. And I think um, following on from what Ellen has just said there, you know, there's never been a more important time to talk about public investment and in research and how we as the taxpayers want to invest that money that we're spending. Um, at Science Foundation Ireland, we're, we're doing a number of things in this crisis, but, but not to take up time for discussion. One of the things that we've done is in collaboration with all of the other major research funders, we've launched a, a rapid response call to look for research and innovation that may help to manage, mitigate, and I suppose on an ongoing basis, help us to, to, to deal with, live with, live with COVID-19. Um, I think one of the challenges, and again, it comes back to some of the things that Ellen was saying, was how do we make sure that we are prioritizing that effort? How do we make sure we're keeping the scientific rigor that we need that Luke spoke about? And how do we make sure that 
that we're making sure that there's a global connectivity there between what's going on. Um, so I suppose my question in terms of what, what we're doing and what the research community are doing is, what would the panel see as, as the critical ways that Irish research teams can contribute? You know, where should we be focusing our effort? Uh, we're, we're seeing loads of great work. The research community have stepped up in terms of, you know, providing PPE, looking at reagent production and some of the things that we need. Um, but, but in the broader picture, when we think about behavioral change, uh, supporting contact tracing, social, social isolation, where do the panel see researchers could really step in and make the biggest difference? Thank you very much for that question. Now, it's a, it's a little tricky because we're obviously all um, operating on Zoom. So, so what I might do is, is to begin with, um, see if either Dr. Or Professor O'Neill or Professor Sam McConkie would like to respond to that question. I can have a go first. I mean, yeah, as you know, Ruth, it's a fantastic response from the Irish scientists in many ways. I mean, we lab was asked to give up equipment and reagents, which we all did very willingly. I think lab are now working in for volunteering to do with the testing. So that's one immediate place we and see it happening among the scientists. Kind of authority Second, I guess even more important one is though obviously the research side and it's great SFI put, it, put this call out because that gives us all a chance to galvanize our efforts. I know every immunologist is eating, sleeping and breathing COVID-19 at the moment, you know. So the fact that we can have an Irish backed consortium of some kind which we're exploring in various ways as you know is superb because all our research could be relevant here. Who, who knows who's going to crack this? It could come from anywhere. And there's some great ideas among Irish scientists as well. The other thing to mention is we have Irish patients to analyze and they add to the mix as well. So um, I think what we'll see now is again, it's this notion of a spotlight. So if you're an immunologist, there's a big spotlight on you now, you know, and how are we responding to that? And we all want to make a difference. To be a scientist means to make discoveries that count and COVID-19 is another example of a, a really important problem that science is trying to crack. Now, could I, could I just see, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, could I see if Dr. Doan or uh, Professor Andrew Hill would like to respond to that question from Dr. Freeman? Um, I mean, no. Nope. Ah, sorry. From my, <laughs> sure. So what, what I was going to suggest, and I guess this is an international issue, is is to have some sort of dashboard and set of systematic reviews going on every month to look at all these different strategies for treatment, so that people can can know, you know, which drugs to prioritize, which drugs to cross off the list. It might be that, that some of these don't work. You know, the, the results were quite disappointing for Kalitra, for lapinavir, ritonavir. Um, I think the jury's still out on hydroxychloroquine, but to have very regular um, systematic reviews, I think, I think because at the moment there's this explosion of clinical trials. People are, I mean, quite rightly, they're trying anything that they can get their hands on. But I think we're, we're going to have a phase probably in the next three months where we actually hone down and, and concentrate on a smaller number of molecules because we're, we're going to need to have a short list to know what to mass produce. Because mm. once we get, say, say favipiravir works from Fujifilm in Japan, they've got stockpiles, but there are no factories in, in the West that are making it. It's made in China and Japan. So we'll have to somehow streamline things at some stage. I got you, Ben Andrew, there. You're absolutely right. I mean, the big question for me is what constitutes scientific rigor now? Okay. In other words, there will be a number of papers coming out. Some will be on this bioarchive, not even refereed. How do we judge all this literature? And how do we say that one yeah. works is a very important one here? How do we know that thing works? Yeah. And then we bring our scientific know how, our scientific training, you know, what we're about as scientists to that question as best we can. Now, clearly, scientists' heads can be turned by something, and we're all human, you know? But we need a collective opinion. The mask debate is a great one, Andrew, in my opinion, and how the CDC changed their guidelines. And, and I, I rang, I know a guy in the CDC, so I asked him, he said they spent two weeks trawling the literature, you know, and looking at all the evidence, going back 25 years on masks, and came to a decision, you see. And that was yeah. stick a cotton thing over your face, and then Trump says he won't do it, you know. So, but you know, for me, it's all about the scientific method, isn't there? The spotlight is on that as well, by the way. What, what does it mean to judge things as a scientist, you know? And what yeah. we bring to these things? And is a 5% effect of remdesivir enough to, 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 to um, approve it? Probably not, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, I completely agree. Could I ask Dr. Doan, would you like to come in on that? 
Yeah, I, I, well, I, I want to make one one comment. I am not the, the best person placed to, to make, to, to set the research priority agenda. I leave that to others. But what is important that while all of that work is going on, is that at the same time we think about the access once products become available. If we postpone that work, if we postpone that thinking and the design of the mechanism that are needed at the global level, until those tools become available, we will be too late. We'll be behind, we will be behind the curve. That is work that needs to be done now. And that will require, of course, political action. And that is a challenge at a time when governments are very much focused on the immediate domestic uh, needs. But if any of you are in a position to, to, to nudge your politicians um, a, a bit towards uh, towards thinking about that, uh, please please do so because at the international level things are um, things are moving. But it would benefit from having national governments uh, come in, and also a very important role, of course, for those who are engaged in the financing of this research to say we we would we will attach conditions to the financing and it would be important if you could for example say if this money leads to a promising result or a promising a promising product that that will be shared and that it can be done through the mechanism that the WHO is currently looking at. Great thank you I, Dr I mean, Freeman does that address your 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 question? Oh, Sam, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, I'm sorry, I just took a call there. I, I'd like to contribute that at research level, Susan, I believe that research on behavioral modification factors mm -hmm. and appropriate use of uh, uh, gloves and gowns and masks yeah. uh, will be helpful. So looking at within a nursing home, within a hospital, what techniques and technologies uh, are better for uh, helping people to use PPA to reinforce the need for be almost behavioural change studies that I know we're thinking about access to medicines and tablets and vaccines, but uh, a lot of our response so far has involved testing equipment, as we mentioned already, but also personal protective equipment. And I, I, my view is that science and scientific rigorous studies with control groups can also help us to do that better. Yeah. I mean, Sam, that's so helpful because we've launched this call, but we want to be reactive. So if there's particular things that we want to ask the research community to respond to, we know they're so reactive when we ask for help. So, I mean, it's great to be able to say to people, look, that's actually a really critical need and we would like to do that. But, but I also think following up on Ellen's point, and I mean, Luke, you have so much experience of this, the fact that we've, I, I think we've set up good systems now in Ireland for public-private partnership with research which really protects the public investment through our, 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 our IP models, where the universities essentially continue to own the IP that's developed, uh, you know, and it can be, be licensed in a very responsible way. So hopefully we're well placed to, to move some things along quickly. But I mean, I would just say from an SFI point of view, for those of you on the front line, and you know, we're so grateful you're all there. But if there's particular things that you need, please contact us because we will do our best to find the right research teams to link them internationally and to fund them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Freeman for that. Um, now I'm going to we have a number of questions that are coming in from different people who have tuned into the webinar today. So I'm going to start with, with one from Dr. Kieran Harkin, who many of you will know from Access to Medicines Ireland. And he has asked, I think we, we slightly touched on um, just now, but does the panel believe that the WTO should endeavour to ensure that IP rights are not a barrier to access to COVID treatments? And I'd like to go to Dr. Doan um, first for, for that question and then invite the other panellists to join. Yeah, thank you. That's, that, that's a very important Important question. Um, the WTO, the World Trade Organization's rules for the protection of intellectual property allow for uh, flexibilities. That means countries can take certain measures when patents, for example, form a barrier. But there are other forms of intellectual property, such as, well, the orphan drug designation would have been one, would have given Gilead seven years of exclusivity that is not happening, but um, that is not an exclusivity that you can compulsory license. Now there is one, um, so there is there is some leeway that countries that, that countries have um, if voluntary licensing or voluntary measures do not do not work. They can intervene. There is one particular uh, problem that is now uh, becoming very clear into focus, 
And that has to do with the special compulsory licensing for exports, because a normal compulsory license is for predominantly the supply of the domestic market. That means that those countries that depend on import for their medicines, NHFs, for example, depends for 70 to 80%, I believe, on imports for its medicines. Um, you would then have to persuade another country to issue a compulsory license so that a, a company can produce to export it to, to you when, when you need it and when you need to take those measures to deal with patent barriers. Now, in 2003, when the TRIPS agreement was amended to allow for this special export compulsory license, a number of high income countries, including the European Union, said unilaterally, we well, we pledge that we will never use this mechanism. We opt out of this mechanism. That means that uh, European Union member states, also the United States did the same, cannot use this, um, use this mechanism to import drugs from elsewhere when they are produced under a compulsory license there. That is, this, this, um, this sounds all uh, quite complicated, and, and it is to a certain extent, but a simple response would be, or a simple immediate response would be for those countries to request the WTO to opt back in. Um, a secondary response should be an examination at the WTO whether there aren't better rules to be designed to, uh, to address these, uh, these issues. So um, on the one hand, there is a lot of space that should be used when necessary. Let's hope it isn't necessary. Let's hope that this international mechanism will come off the ground and second, Countries have unilaterally put in restrictions on their own ability to use these mechanisms, which they need to lift now. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hill, could I ask you for your your thoughts on that question? Yeah, I, I think we need to remember with, with these repurposed drugs for coronavirus, the, the, the companies didn't design them to, to, to work. I mean, this is a brand new disease. They're working by chance, if they work at all. A lot of the trials have been run with public money, with Gates Foundation, different ministries of health, China, uh, where the drug companies donate drugs, they actually get a tax rebate. They can actually make money by donating drugs for the trials. And the money spent by the pharma companies in almost all cases is very small and could just be repaid to them. So I think in this special case of coronavirus, there's a case for just buying down the company's research to say, well, how much should you spend? It might be a very small amount of money. And then taking over the intellectual property and making sure that we can mass produce the drugs to treat anybody in the world. We just, we haven't got time to get into all these long wrangling discussions about IP for, for drugs that the, the, the company's never intended to, to, for them to work on coronavirus because it's brand new. Um, could, I, could I see if, uh, thank, thanks for that, uh, could I see if um, either Professor O'Neill or Professor McConkey would like to weigh in on that question? No. Okay. Um, well then, my next question actually is, how significant the public contribution to research on COVID-19 in Ireland is, as in the research that is carried out by hospital doctors and universities? I think we seem to have a little glitch with our technology here. Is um, is Professor McConkey there? Yeah. Um, so oh, sorry, I was off taking a phone call, Susan. I'm sorry. I've no been problem. in and out. So apologies. You're busy. Um, we no, totally no. understand. So um, well, please, please don't worry. So um, I, the the challenge is uh, that. We're trying to look after a lot of sick patients and we're trying to reorganize our whole hospitals. Uh, and at the same time, some of us are doing an awful lot of kind of public media and even political briefing. And then at the same time, with those four jobs, you're also trying to design good research trials. So it's 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 in the in the middle of all this, it's it's been challenging to to try and get good research trials. Then initially we didn't have enough patients. So so now we are seeing numbers going through that allow us to, to do good studies, but uh, three, four weeks ago when we were planning them, it was hard to get access to, 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 to funding or drugs because we didn't have the patient. That's if you don't know how many patients you're going to have. So what, what we're doing is really working with existing networks. Uh, so groups around the world that we've been working with for and trying to, to build large, large groupings that, that allow us to, 
uh, have bigger sample size. You, you do need many hundreds of people to sort of show anything and you need hundreds again in the control group and you need a solid methodology that everyone on each site is following in the same way. So the the only work that well, we've done two bits, one is on modeling that we've sent off for publication and the other is on cytokine response and trying to understand the changes in lymphocytes and neutrophils and chemokines and cytokines that, that we see in people with severe COVID-19 versus people with mild COVID-19 versus normal healthy people and the answer is there's lots of things you see there's a lot of dynamic stuff happening in the immune system trying to work out what's the uh, causing what is more challenging uh, so it's there's certainly a, a very large Im immune response and we're seeing that looking at in fact some of the Chinese have done a very good job on looking at chemokine and cytokine response but I, I, I think it's too early I don't have any credible results that I can tell you uh, right now that, that we produced here but we're, we're working on studies and, and trying to come up with some results. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Professor O'Neill. Could I ask thank you, you to? Yeah, I mean, um, in, in yeah. James is that we, we've got a traditional institute in James. It's every patient, the samples are being taken, all the things Sam mentioned are being measured in them, you know, because you can get really good information from this. And you are measuring the immune system in these patients basically and how it's changing over time. So that's a very informative thing to do. Severe, sort of, if the disease becomes very severe, there's clear biomarkers that predict that. There's all very good science going on. And, and I'm also refereeing papers from around the world as well. I mean, I just refereed a paper, get this. This just shows you the Irish scale versus China. Uh, it was a paper with 2,000 patient samples were assessed, right? right? Everything was measured in those patients. We call this multi-omics, as Sam knows. You know? So every possible thing was measured in these patients. And they came to some very interesting conclusions. And I've just accepted the paper actually this morning. So, so it's a, it is a global effort. The Irish have their part to play. There could be specific things about the Irish population that would stand out. Hepatitis C was a great example of that, by the way, because of anti-D, as people might know. So, so the Irish patients, it's great they're playing a part in this. And we may discover things in those patients that might be useful. And then as Sam said, the clinical trial bit, it's good that the Irish patients are getting access now to some of these experimental drugs. And let's see what that tells us as well. So I think the patient yeah. participation is essential, actually. Thank you. And could I ask, actually, it's a question that is uh, very much uh, geared or directed towards uh, Professors O'Neill um, and McConkie. What can the Irish government do to advocate at a global level? What steps can it do? And, 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 and does it have much clout? Can it even do much? We're a very small country, obviously. I, I wouldn't be expert in, in um, what the government can and can't do, sadly, Susan. But uh, SFI's initiative and HOB is fantastic. Let's start with that. They're putting money up to fund networks and, and what's very important about the SFI initiative is it's very internationally connected so in other words our labs are connected with labs in MIT in Harvard best practice fantastic you know and, and building that international dimension is essential so first of all public funding for research is, is a great thing to see the policy stuff I will leave that to my uh, my, my betters there but I, I, I think to the Irish government would be great to be a voice the very stuff Ellen, Ellen was talking about the Irish yeah. government should be in behind that. Look what the Israelis did for it. That's really interesting. Ellen's talk, I thought, was brilliant, by the way. Look what the Israeli I mean, government did. We, our, the Irish government should be doing the same. I mean, if we didn't have public funding of research, we wouldn't have people like Luke and, and Sam here doing their work. So that's that's the starting point. We, we need experts. Every country needs its own depth in and expertise in, in areas related to medicine. But, but the call is international, so our researchers can use it to work internationally. And we're also at SFI working with Irish Aid because that dimension of a global health issue is very important. Now, we haven't got any specific projects yet, but luckily we had just set up a partnership with them to do just that. So we're starting seeing projects coming through on climate change and energy that have that global perspective and Irish researchers want to work on them. And as Irish taxpayers, we should be contributing our share to that global effort. I, I think perhaps the question was probably um, geared more towards, although it, it, it's not entirely clear, but was geared more towards um, what the government could do around intellectual property rights, etc., cetera, uh, that companies might try to hold on to. So perhaps uh, Dr. Hohen, Dahoen, you might have a, have a view on that. Yeah, I, th I think it would be important for, for Ireland. Ireland is part of what's called the Beneluxi, which is a, a subset of European countries that work together on questions related to um, access to medicines and medicines pricing. And that might be a good coalition to take this issue to uh, and, and say, as Beneluxi, shouldn't we have a position on the proposal of the COVID-19 pool at the WHO and signal to the WHO that we want this to work and that we lend our support. Um, of course, having the backing from 
uh, from research institutes, from researchers themselves, would be, would be quite important. I think many researchers are worried about uh, the outcome of what they are engaged in uh, not becoming available, not becoming available on a large enough scale. So uh, build, this, build this coalition and that would have to happen quickly because things really develop and take place at a, at a very rapid pace. But um, th that might be a very good a very good starting point because in the Benelux side, you're already working with governments, with sort of like-minded governments that have sorted out some of these issues amongst themselves already. Actually, could I ask, could I just ask you a question on that Benelux A group, um, Dr. Doan? Have they had much success? Because we joined that group and I think we also joined a separate grouping um, in the South or in Southern Europe as well uh, that tries to, you know, I suppose to whereby governments and experts in different countries put their heads together um, on different drugs that are coming down, coming down the, the tracks. But I don't believe that there has has there been much success in that. You know, have countries per jointly purchased many drugs via the Benelux A group? No, they haven't yet. But I think that that's precisely what will change. You know, the new. Uh, if we go back to, to the normal life, it will be a new normal life. So much will have changed, and particularly in this, in this area. So what we've seen in the Benelux and what a lot, of, a lot of European countries have experienced with access to medicines and trying to negotiate better prices, that it is very, very difficult to negotiate with someone who holds the, holds the monopoly. I think the corona crisis is driving a lot of in this area, um, which will have a spillover beyond the corona crisis and products for for to addressing to address the the, the pandemic more uh, more broadly okay thank you another question that has come through is um a question around um ppe you know we've seen countries and emily o'reilly alluded to this earlier on in her her opening speech you know countries trying to take ppe shipments from other countries by offering to pay more money i think somebody you know described it as, as modern day piracy by the united states um you know when this pandemic hits lower and middle income countries hard what are the possible scenarios regarding the accessibility of ppe and vaccines in these countries and how can we act early to ensure that they do get access? I think Susan, if I could speak to that, I, I think in the last number of years, there's been a sort of a tendency towards nationalism, which we've seen obviously in, in US and UK and several, Hungary, several other countries. And unfortunately, the responses of many countries to coronavirus has been to put up barriers and walls and act in a more or nationalistic way. That's partly because our health services in Europe are organized at the level of nation state and are not coordinated in a detailed way across the European Union. But one of the things I, I think we have to do is try and promote multilateral decision making and international responses to this. It's quite possible that several euro users might try and leave the euro if, if it, it could fall to bits in part because of this. Similarly, it's a threat to the EU, in my view, the existence of the EU uh, could be uh, called into question through this coronavirus because it may affect different uh, parts of Europe differently and depending on how we stick together through the crisis. So, so my view is that our Irish government really needs to promote uh, as they have done for the last 100 years, this international solidarity in, in responses. And I, I feel that's been lacking a bit in, uh, you know, certainly in the European Union. Uh, obviously, the UN has taken a lead role and certainly WHO has. And I, I think that also needs, we need to stick in solidarity with low and middle income countries. Ireland has seven or eight countries where we do a lot of Irish aid work. Stick with the partnerships we already have and try and promote uh, testing and PPE and control and whatever we, we can do to help those partner countries. I think should continue. Thank you. Um, anyone else on the panel like to come in on that question? Okay, well then another another question that came through is for Professor Hill. Um, someone asked, could you just um, remind us when your work is going to be published? I think you mentioned Friday, but perhaps you could just confirm that. Yeah, it's it's this Friday, this Friday morning. Oh. So and and where, where is it being published? The journal, journal of Virus Eradication, we've done a lot of publications in there. They've got a special um, fast turnaround for papers on coronavirus. And just generally speaking, could I ask the panel, do you see capacity issues 
you know, across the world if drugs, you know, drugs to treat, to successfully treat COVID-19, um, you know, are, are proven to work and if vaccines become available, are we going to see widespread shortages or can we manage that? I there are up with that, Susan. So, um, I mean, you got you got to give credit to the pharma sector as well, remember, and, and, and they're changing. Now, this is the, the broader question. After COVID-19, will they maintain this change? And what about beyond this disease? You know, what about other infectious diseases, for example? Um, but um, they're all, I mean, GSK, who I've got a conflict of interest, I consult for them. They, they said they will switch over some of their vaccine manufacturing plants to help with this. They're making their adjuvant available, they're very powerful immune stimulant available. I know AstraZeneca uh, have a, 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 a a subsidiary called Medimmune. They're real experts in making antibodies. Again, they're saying we will switch our systems over to make these things. And we're seeing that. Now, maybe um, it's apple pie stuff. I don't know. But and, and, and Ellen might have a bit stronger view than me or other people, maybe. But, but the message I'm getting is everybody's aware of the scaling up crisis that will come. If any of these, how do you scale it up? And they're all, look, as we speak, they're now looking at that supply chains, how to change a plant over to this instead of that. So it's very much in people's minds. Um, the question again would be, who's going to pay for it? Will Big Pharma pay for all this? I don't know. I suspect they will because they're trying to make a difference as well, remember. Again, talk about the capitalist system collapsing. <laughs> Maybe the pharmaceutical sector will be the first to become like, I don't know. So you, you're optimistic. I'm, I'm, you're I'm, optimistic. optimistic. I'm, I'm making jokes here half the time, so don't, don't come at me. I, 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 I think it's just it depends. <laughs> uh, it, depends my view on that. it depends what sort of solution works. If it's a small little chemical molecule like remdesivir, that's relatively easy to to make it's not that different from the little nucleotides that make up our dna and rna it's, it's easy to synthesize in in bulk and relatively cheap to, you could sort of as i said famously to the sunday mail uh, you could reprofile the viagra plant in cork to make remdesivir and that, that's that's feasible whereas if it's some complicated large monoclonal antibody that's a difficult thing to make and and that that's going to be really really challenging to scale up a monoclonal antibody for eight billion people in the world so it actually depends what what exact chemical nature this successful product has and and we hope it's a simple easy to synthesize one but it's uh, unfortunately it's not just the new drugs that, that are a problem here you've got all these basic generic drugs used to manage and look after people when they when they get ill with coronavirus and in france in new york they're getting terrible shortages of really basic antibiotics of anesthetics and i mean i was i, I had, had a long chat with people in in um, paris last week they're literally running out of the drugs and um they could called i ask in, you could, could i ask you and sorry to cut across you there uh, professor hill but yeah. could, could, could i ask you is that because just facilities have not had the time to ramp up quickly enough or because many of the ingredients come from say china where supply chains have been interrupted but what's the cause the cause of that well there's three things first of all because of the epidemic the, the the supply of the basic raw ingredients was shut down in china for eight weeks and then a lot of the drugs are then sent from china to india to be formulated and the formula because of the india went into lockdown the transport started failing there. So this, so you've got supply slowing down, plus you've got demand just off the scale. You've got drugs being used 20 times the current rate. So you've got this sort of perfect storm. And I mean, the, the, the French were within two or three days of running out of everything. It's not just them. King's College Hospital in London was complaining about it. There, there, there was a letter from nine different European hospitals saying, you know, right now we've got to have these basic generics. And I mean, you might have a, a company like GSK that that has their own branded drugs. They're in, they're in control of the whole supply chain. But these old generic drugs, you, you're relying on route, you know, on on an a, you know maybe single or two API suppliers in China, and it's it's something that really needs managing at a, at a European level. I think there are European commissioners getting involved in this because it's, I mean, it's an issue for you know right now. It's the, the shortages are really bad. Susan, no, this, this is the toilet roll issue, actually, you know, yeah. in a way. <laughs> wow. uh, it is because they're, 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 every, every health agency, and I've had the same thing as Andrew yeah. said, they're buying up stocks to try to make sure they don't run out, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the basics now, aren't available. What I might do, um, uh, just to, to say to the panel is, I've, I've received so many questions, which is fantastic, um, but we are keen to try to wrap up as we have planned um, this session at 11.30. So what I might do is, you know, go through these questions and perhaps just get two panelists to respond to each question so I can um, so we can actually try to try to answer 
almost all of the questions that have come through. So the first one is from um, Evelyn Mulrow of Cancer Trials Ireland, who said speed from protocol to regulatory submission is crucial um, in COVID-19 trials. Cancer Trials Ireland is experienced in running trials and is offering support to the community. How important is a centralized approach to trials in COVID-19 when speed to getting treatments to patients is critical? Any takers for that question? Yeah, well, I, I, I can speak to that. I, I think the centralized approach is, is really helpful and Cancer Trials Ireland have a network of eight or nine hospitals already have a research database manager, data entry people and research nurses in, in that. I, I suppose the question is, is that big enough? Uh, the challenge is that many of the studies are being done in multiple countries uh, with, with researchers from, uh, you know, maybe 20 or 50 sites involved. So I, I think the answer is yes, but perhaps also on an international dimension as well as just a national one. Would anybody else like to respond to that question? Okay. Then I also have one from James O'Mahony, who is an economist at Trinity College Dublin, and many of you will already know James. I, I do. Hello, James, and thanks for joining. He has asked, if we want private R&D spend as part of the solution, which obviously we do, um, do we not need to recognise that firms will either have to earn profits in order to recoup R&D costs, or they will have to incur costs as part of a corporate social responsibility effort? The latter, he said, might not be enough to require or to encourage the level of spending we actually need. If I could ask Dr. Doan to come in um, on that question. Well, I, I think we first need to recognise that the, um, the public sector contribution is, is significant. We spent as, as the globe last year 50 billion, 58 billion, I mean 54 billion, on the purchase of vaccines. Um, that is, in a, in a sense, that is public money because that is money that comes out of our public institutions that is spent on the procurement of vaccines. So there, is, um, there are significant resources in the private sector that can be deployed. I am, I, I am not at all against reasonable, reasonable profits, but maybe the profit-driven mechanism here is not the best way to go. I would say let's create the activity on the innovation side. Let's spend the money directly on the innovation. Let, let that market bloom, so to speak. Then we don't need to worry about prices and profit and making profits from selling the products. That could be at minimum level to make sure that the systems are, are oiled sufficiently to have to keep the production and the supply going. But let's focus on spending the money on the innovation side. Side. Corporations where a lot of the knowledge and compounds and, and, and technology sits can make it an enormously important contribution, but they won't be, the, won't be the only ones. And then we will also get the collaboration on, on that side, because that's where the action, uh, the action need to be. So this is not so much a discussion about should they be allowed to make profits or not. No, this is about what kind of a mechanism do you want to put in place to make this work? I, I Professor Hill, I'd love to, uh, if I could just ask actually, and then I'll come back to you if that's okay, um, Professor yep. O'Neill, because you've done a huge amount of work on um, the costing of medicines. Could I ask you to respond to that question from, from James O'Mahony? Yes, yeah, so I think it's up to the, for the, for the repurposed drugs, the ones for right now, the drug companies need to be very honest about how much exactly they're spending on these trials. I think we're going to find that for the majority of the trials, it's a very small amount of money. And they could even be repaid for that. But I don't see why a drug that's fundamentally cheap, that wasn't designed to treat coronavirus, should just be allowed to be uh, launched at its original price for other diseases. I just don't think there's, a, there's any economic rationale for that. I mean, it's the, these, if these drugs are fundamentally cheap and some, and, you know, we, we've developed them, we've, we've run the trials with public money, um, I think all bets are off and that the drug should just be mass produced. We, do, we don't have time otherwise. Um, Professor O'Neill? Yeah, just very briefly. So, I mean, I mean, um, if hydroxychloroquine works, and I remember it may well work, I know I was plus minus a bit earlier, uh, but it may work. If that happened, look how cheap it is. Andrew tells us it's cheap as chips. Yeah. Any, any company could make that, any generic company in bulk, and now it's available. So let's, let's see what happens there. But more generally, I think you've got to remember, it's a very complex ecosystem, this drug discovery business. It needs investment. 
at risk often. You need venture capital to back it. That's the reason why that's there. Big pharma, of course, is a successful industry and they have reserves of all kinds. But did you know, now maybe someone listening will correct me, not a single drug was discovered in the Soviet Union, you know, over the course of 50 years, not a single medicine, they think. And the reason is it didn't have the entrepreneurial VC commercial side going aggressively as well. So it's not, it's not as straightforward as it seems. But I do think we're going to reinvent it, Susan. I mean, as I said earlier, when we come out of this, pharma will have changed and the models will be different. Just a final question to the panel before, before, before we break. And you mentioned that it, it kind of builds upon your point there, you know, that pharma will have changed, the model will have changed. Do you think, um, because it's something that's always surprised me, you know, and it probably doesn't really apply, unfortunately, to, to you anymore, uh, Professor Hill, but th those of us who are still in the European Union, you know, are you surprised that we haven't jointly procured and jointly purchased drugs? And is this perhaps, will this be the trigger that we need to start going down that road? I, I think it's very scary how a lot of the a lot of the countries, including the UK, have just become very insular. And you've had these bidding wars for scarce supplies of drugs. We, It's just not going to work like that because you'll end up with some countries um, having massive shortages while other countries are, are hoarding and don't necessarily need the supplies that they've they've bought um it, it, it it's going to need to be centralized I, th I think actually more fundamentally we need to think about european pr local production security of supply we i think what this epidemic has shown is that we assume that the chinese would always be able to make all the raw ingredients the indians would always be able to formulate them and that system would be secure it's like the banking crisis you know thinking the banks will never fail well the, the supply chain is failing and you've got these tragic situations in hospitals in Italy and France where they're literally running out of drugs. And I think it just showed that we, we need new stress tests on the pharmaceutical supply chain in the same way that we've got stress tests on the banking system. It, it, it's, it's a lesson that we've, we have to learn. Would, thank you, uh, Professor Hill. Would any, any of our other panelists like to come in on that final question about the European Union? Well, I, I, I think, and, and, and Professor McConkie already made, made a similar comment, it is worrisome how nationalistic the approaches are. Um, I'm, I'm a great supporter of, of the European Union and I'm a proud European, but I'm also shocked at the lack of solidarity uh, within the European Union. And that is something that would need to be, be re-examined. As, as I said, it's, it's um, to a certain extent understandable that national governments look at national needs at this stage, but I hope that that will, will very rapidly change and that a sense of, of, of stronger solidarity will kick in. Now, as to the healthcare system in Europe, that is not integrated. We have an integrated market. We have an integrated market for pharmaceuticals, but we don't have an integrated way of making sure that those pharmaceuticals are available and affordable uh, to all. And I would suspect that that is also something that might change in the near future. Um, well, look, on that note, I'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers and panelists this morning. And um, we're obviously all here under very unusual uh, circumstances. Uh, the technology seemed to work a, a lot better than I had, uh, a, lot, a, a lot more smoothly than I had expected. I thought we'd have a few more glitches than we did. So I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. So uh, Professor McConkie, Professor O'Neill, Dr. Hill, Dr. Dolan, thank you very much for taking uh, the time to talk to us all and to share your expertise and insight with us. It really is much appreciated. To those of you who have tuned in, can I just say that we're going to be back at 11.40 with our second panel of the day, which is talking about the opportunity for socio-cultural and political reform. There's some excellent speakers lined up. Kay Curtin, a patient advocate. Jackie Brown, another patient advocate. Dr. Gail Kirkorian, a patient advocate um, who with the IHREC Disability Advisory Committee, um, Mr. Darren O'Rourke, who is a TD, a well-known TD, and also a scholar who is going to talk about the politics of access and medicines reform. And finally, Dermot MacDonald, who also joined us last year from Just Treatment. So I'll see you all back here, hopefully at 11.40. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan.
Hello? Hello? Hi, Susan. Oh, hi. Hello, how are you? I just wanted to make hi, sure I was Susan. actually there. Sheila, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Not too bad. Can you hear me, Susan? Who, who's up there? Sorry. It's Kay. Kay, hi, hi how are you doing? Hi, Susan. Good, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Um, have, and Jack uh, is here. So I'm checking, any others? Oh, hi, Jackie. Hi, how are you? Good. We're live at the moment, just. Okay. So are we ready to ready to start? Hi folks, I'm just checking. Are we ready to start? Fire ahead, yeah. Susan, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, I think we have all our speakers. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for rejoining us. I hope you all managed to get a quick cup of tea or coffee um, on the break there. As I mentioned, um, for our second panel discussion this afternoon, the topic that we're focusing in on, or the area that we're focusing in on, is the opportunity for socio-cultural and political reform. Um, we have a really, really great panel, and well done to Access to Medicines for, 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 for organizing such, such a brilliant panel um, today. We start off with Kay Curtin, a patient advocate, who I know, thank you Kay for, for joining us, and also Jackie Brown, another patient advocate. Um, then uh, Dr. Gail Kerkorian, who works with MSF or Medicines Sans Frontières or Doctors, Doctors Without Borders, um, is going to be speaking on the need for radical changes to ensure access to essential health tools. Darren O'Rourke um, will also speaking, be speaking for a short period. Darren is a TD and also a scholar. And finally, we're going to finish with Dermot MacDonald of Just Treatment which has done a huge amount of campaigning over in the UK um, in recent times, especially around cystic fibrosis drugs such as or, or can be. Um, so at the end of the panel discussion, like what we did earlier this morning or after they've spoken, we're going to open it up for a discussion and we will be taking questions from those of you who have tuned in. So please do feel free to submit any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists today. And we'll have a, a, a panel discussion of about 45 minutes when our speakers have given a brief outline of their views on their respective topics. So if I could start off, please, by welcoming Kay Curtin. Kay, you're very welcome. And if you'd like to Hi, take the stage. Um, before, I before I start, I just want to thank Access to Meds again for asking me to speak today. It's always a great pleasure to be part of this group. Um, I was asked to discuss what it's like to live without access to the treatment that you might need. And unfortunately, having stage four cancer made me very aware that when it comes to getting treatment for your medical condition, particularly if the treatment is innovative or expensive, nothing can be taken for granted about gaining access to medicines. We all know that daily life is generally easier to cope with despite its many obstacles and anxieties. If we believe or at least buy into the narrative that when you have the misfortune to become seriously ill, all the stops will be pulled out on your behalf. But unfortunately, this is a fallacy of the well. Whilst there might be much goodwill on behalf of your medical team to do all that they can on your behalf, they are all too often constrained in what they can offer because of decisions made by government bodies beyond the front line of the hospital or the general practice clinic. Although your desire as the patient may lie with receiving the latest groundbreaking medicine, the reality of accessing it can be a harsh awakening for the patient. You may find yourself on the roulette wheel of access that I spoke about at last year's Access to Meds conference, where your timing of diagnosis, your geographical location, knowledge of your physician, your government's policy on reimbursement, or even your ability to pay will become the defining factors that work against with you or with you to determine your chances of survival or living with the best achievable quality of life. Last year, I gave an example of delays in access to adjuvant treatment for stage three melanoma patients. One year later, this has shamefully remained static, now leaving us one of the last in Europe yet again to reimburse a new treatment. 
this story is replicated across many diseases and disabilities. And we are often failed by the system as patients and the drive to make profit over saving lives. We're reimbursing at such a snail's pace in Ireland. We cannot possibly keep pace with research in the clinical setting. Continuously, I see posts from our HTA advising reimbursement only recommended if cost effectiveness can be improved relative to existing treatments. That does not tell us anything about the human cost to these patients waiting months and even years for new treatments that may be more effective in reducing their pain or prolonging their lives and are generally available elsewhere. <clears throat> I'm fearful now of an even more barren reimbursement landscape post COVID-19. As resources become scarcer, and are directed towards conditions considered by government departments, cost benefit fails as being a better investment. Unfortunately, right now, we're already seeing evidence of this added hurdle of COVID-19. Already, we've seen the suspension of cancer screening programs, routine surgeries, treatments, follow-up CTs and MRIs. Patients already in the system are rightly worried about accessing care and they're afraid of being considered dispensable. They're living on a tight rope until a co solution for COVID-19 can be found. Those who have already been left endlessly to wait understand this is not an unfounded fear, but now this threat is in. Oh, okay, you seem to- Okay, okay. You're back, sorry, there was a tiny glitch, but you're back, don't worry. Okay, those who have already been left endlessly to wait understand this is not unfound, an unfounded fear, but now this threat is in danger of becoming reality for many thousands more who may have up to this recent crisis been living well with their disease or disability. Jonathan Cooper, a human rights specialist, wrote recently in a blog called Dignity, the Right to Life and the Coronavirus to seek to establish yardsticks which would value one life over another, would fundamentally undermine the core principles of human dignity, and to even contemplate drawing up criteria that would formalize the suggestion that one person's life is worth more than someone else's could not be countenanced. But this need not prevent difficult choices being made, but each one is on an individual assessment. Some big questions will have to be asked in the coming months about how we treat the ill in our society, and many more will suffer if we fail to act in a way that values humanity and dignity over economic outcomes. This will affect each and every one of us, but some more directly than others, because they will pay with their lives. If we don't continue to value the vulnerable and provide timely access to medicines. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution. And now I'd, I'd like to welcome Jackie Brown, who, as I said earlier, is a patient advocate and is also on the committee with the Irish Human Rights Equality Commission. Um, and Jackie is going to discuss ethical concerns, questions and imperatives from a patient perspective in a pandemic. Jackie, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and, and to everyone listening in today and to AMI for the invitation to speak with you this morning. Um, I want to make, um, to make you think about a few questions and issues from a patient perspective as a patient advocate involved across a range of organisations. So it is widely acknowledged, as we know, um, accepted and fully respected that we're in a time of crisis with this COVID-19 pandemic in Ireland. However, there's also an awful lot of unease amongst patients and patient groups to find that the Department of Health, the Irish Department of Health, in the last week of March, very quietly issued a document entitled An Ethical Framework for Decision Making in a Pandemic. This document position paper just seemed to appear out of absolutely nowhere, unbeknownst and without consultation or forewarning amongst patients, vulnerable groups or organisations. On page eight of the document, it is stated that good decision making is maintained by using explicit and transparent processes and having clear lines of accountability. By then, have we no idea who drafted this framework, who represented the patients, vulnerable persons, disabled persons, and the public in drafting this document? There is no reference to the European Convention on the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, the Irish Constitution, the Equal Status Act, 
the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, amongst other international instruments. In fact, there seems to be no references to any well-established ethical or legal framework, except a statement on page 15 that reflects that is reflects the WHO guidance for managing ethical issues in infectious disease outbreaks. The document also gives no idea of how it dovetails with professional codes of conduct for healthcare professionals that have a strong human rights base. We believe the ethical principles and values outlined in the document should be clarified further in plain English and shared widely, including through social media with the public. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina Devendas, in her statement on March 17th, COVID-19, who is protecting people with disabilities, she stressed that persons with disabilities deserve to be reassured that their survival is a priority and urged states to establish clear protocols for public health emergencies to ensure that when medical resources are scarce, access to healthcare, including life-saving measures, does not discriminate against people with disabilities. To quote her, she says, to face the pandemic, it is crucial that information about how to prevent and contain the coronavirus is accessible to everyone, she explained. Public advice campaigns and information from national health authorities must be made available to the public in sign language and accessible means, modes and formats, including accessible digital technology, captioning, relay services, text services, easy to read and plain language. Organisations of people with disabilities should be consulted and involved in all stages of the COVID-19 response, she concluded. What has sometimes been neglected, including by legislators and policymakers, is that protecting the right to health is in itself also a hard legal obligation of states. Merely protecting public health in a general sense is not enough. Rather, what is required is protecting the right to health and all that a rights-based response entails, including notably equal protection for all persons without discrimination. For example, Article 25 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it sets out the right to the health of people with disabilities. It includes the provision of the same range, quality and standard of healthcare as others, and the prevention of discriminatory denial of healthcare or health services or foods and fluids on the basis of disability. On March 26th last, a group of UN Special Rapporteurs published a joint statement, again reminding states of the principle of non-discrimination in the provision of life-saving interventions. Among the groups highlighted are people with disabilities, people who live in residential institutions or who are in detention. They call on states to provide additional social protection measures so that their support reaches to those who are at most at risk of being disproportionately affected by the crisis. The following day, the UN experts um, on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons, Rosa Cornfield Matt, she published a statement. Among other things, she said the triage protocols must be followed, developed and followed to ensure that such decisions are made on the basis of medical needs, the best scientific available information, and not on med non-medical criteria such as age or disability. Some other key issues of concern to patients, and especially those of us who are vulnerable or who have disabilities, are what we commonly refer to and understand as next of kin and consent issues. Decision or decisions around treatment such as DNR, CPR policies, advanced healthcare directives and other end of life decisions raise very serious moral and ethical questions for everyone. The reliance of next of kin to make medical decisions in emergencies has no legal basis in Ireland. It is also important to note that while the HSE has a consent policy, which was last updated in 2016, it is not fully compliant with the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, and neither is the Assisted Decision Making Act of 2015. Unless the family member has been given an enduring power of attorney, which has taken effect, or is appointed to the Committee Ward of Court under the Ward of Court process, they have no legal authority to make decisions about the person's medical treatment, including the withdrawal of life saving, sustaining treatment. The HSE consent policy also states 
in emergency situations where a service user is deemed to lack capacity, consent is not necessary. The health and social care professional may treat the service user provided the treatment is immediately necessary to save their life or to prevent a serious deterioration of their condition and that there is no valid advance refusal of treatment. Future COVID treatment, medicines, trials and vaccines, questions of concern. Article 10 of the UN Convention obliges the state to protect the right to life of persons with disabilities. All lives have equal value. Decisions based on, on the distribution of life-saving resources must not be based on the presence of a disability. The World Medical Association Ethical Guidance for the Provision of Life-Saving Treatment states that in selecting the patients who may be saved, the physicians should consider only their medical status and predictive response to the treatment and should exclude any other consideration based on non-medical criteria. Jackie, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just, we're just a quite a bit over on time, so just okay. to give you a, a bit of a, a, a warning shot for one to All one. right, okay, I'm on the last bit anyway, okay. Um, right, so I'll, I'll skip one part, all right. So there's nothing specific in the Assisted Decision Making Act about clinical trials and the capacity to choose, to participate in those. So the same general rules would apply as with capacity to make other decisions. Of course, there's still the doctrine of necessity in our common law which would permit doctors to make emergency interventions to save a patient's life without that person's consent. Finally, I'd like to say just a few words about access to medicines, including any future vaccines for COVID-19 and the human rights duties of pharma. Based on the historical experience of HIV and other epidemics, there is reason to be wary of profiteering by pharmaceutical companies if and when a vaccine emerges. We need to reclaim the focus on health, human rights and the public interest in an industry that has for too long been driven by profiteering. We need to invoke and further strengthen the power of government and the duty of the pharma industry to abide by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to ensure that future drugs and vaccines are widely affordable and accessible to patients and populations worldwide. Thank you. Jackie, thank you very much. And I'm sorry to have rushed you a little bit, a little bit at the end. That was a really, uh, really insightful um, topic. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kerkorian, can I just double check that you're with us? Yes. Can Excellent. Um, thank you and, and welcome. Thank you. Um, so I think what I'm going to say is going to echo some of uh, the discussion started during the first session. As you can imagine as an uh, international medical humanitarian organization uh, providing life-saving medical care in more than 70 countries, MSF knows very well what it means uh, to not be able to treat people because the needed medicine is too expensive or simply not available. I think one key realization that needs to take place in the context of the current unprecedented uh, crisis is that it's high time that we stop pretending that the reliance on the market mechanism is fit to provide medical care and health, new, uh, health tools to all uh, the people who need them. Of course, since its creation, MSF has experienced the gaps and the barriers such a model is creating. Uh, the access campaign of MSF has worked to tackle them for more than 20 years now. With the COVID-19 right now, every single person on the planet can experience firsthand the failure of the current pharmaceutical system. So for each of us, uh, we know, you know, it can mean uh, no diagnostic, no treatment, uh, no ventilator, no vaccine. And of course, for society as a whole, it's, it's a disaster. But before COVID-19, uh, we knew that uh, the number of people who were excluded from access was and is uh, growing in every country, including in the most wealthy ones. People lack access to new saving treatments. Uh, seven years ago, it was uh, mentioned um, earlier in the discussion, obvious rationing started with hepatitis C medicine. And since then, the problems became obvious in many disease area, whether it's diabetes, cancer, rare disease, and so on. But countries are also experiencing uh, increasing shortages of old products uh, that are of no interest for pharmaceutical companies because they are 
there is too little money to make with them. In the recent year, the stress for many countries was the lack of, as it was said, basic antibiotics such as penicillin, you know, such an old product, but very good product, product like insulin, adrenaline, um, atropine, lidocaine, etc. And right now, in the context of the COVID pandemic, as uh, Andrew was mentioning, again, key antibiotic like amoxicillin, doxycycline, but also morphine uh, reagent for diagnostic are missing. And in fact, even if you can buy them, you know, sometimes you you they are simply not available or, you know, they have been sold to somebody who is, uh, you know, the highest bidder. As it is the case with some vaccine and, you know, for instance, in MSF, we experience it uh, with the HPV. Uh, the issue is often that there is a limited number of companies controlling the market uh, through monopolies, but also through oligopolies and relying on a limited number of, or, of API manufacturers. So the source of the raw material. The consequence uh, of limited availability, I mean, as a consequence of this context, we see public health policy based on rationing now spreading globally. And if you look at what's going on now, the fact that diagnostic is not part of confinement policy in many countries, uh, it's only the case because these countries, such as my country, France, do not have the capacity to generalize testing. Basic equipment to prevent the spread of the epidemic, you know, we've said it, face masks, gloves, basic protection material, but also life-saving equipment like ventilators are missing. This is the result uh, of local capacity decreasing or disappearing because governments decided to count on globalized supply in the belief that, uh, you know, the market would provide these tools uh, as and when needed. And in fact, what we've seen is that countries have slowly relinquished their power to exert their health sovereignty, which is, you know, their power to protect and promote health and health services. I think we're in a key moment because uh, although all this is true, uh, we also can, I think, change the trend and redesign the organizing of our health system in ways that really are about improving health for all people. The vaccine, the funding of the vaccine against COVID-19, I think is for instance, an opportunity. Uh, of, course to, of course, to put the resources on health priorities, but also to plan uh, the condition of access uh, from day one. And as Ellen Toon was saying, this is happening right now. Very simple questions uh, need to be asked and answered publicly. Uh, for instance, you know, so what exactly do we need? How much exactly does it cost? Who is paying? How do we guarantee access for all uh, in need in the end, you know, at the end of the R&D process? The answers to these questions uh, must set the terms of the collaboration between the stakeholders. And it's not enough, good enough to say that there is goodwill or people may change. I think we need to look at what are the terms of the collaboration? What, how do we write them, basically? Those terms must define uh, a social contract that ensure transparent and fair use of public resources, because as it was said, there is a lot of public resources being put on medicine and on R&D, and collective governance of essential health tools as common goods. It's not only because the pharmaceutical economy is heavily uh, subsidized by public money and uh, insurance systems, but it's also because as it is, as it is made obvious now, in New York, in Madrid, or elsewhere, the health of the public should be a matter of public concern. MSF is deeply concerned, you know, of course, you know, about the access to the test, but also to any forthcoming drugs or vaccine for COVID-19 in places where MSF works, but also, you know, in, in other countries that are affected by this pandemic. So unless we build a public health system based on global solidarity, in which as it was said, every life counts. No one will be safe from this or from other illnesses. That's why we are urging government to 
change the rules. And I agree with Ellen Toon, we need to change some of the norms. We need to put health before profits. We need to put access before patents, transparency of price of cost before trade secrets, for instance, and organize collective governance instead of working with unilateral control uh, by large company. This is required uh, to ensure that we have the health tools that we need uh, available in every continent and, and affordable. And I think it's a, there is a matter of general realization uh, that then, you know, if we have the politic will, political will and the political will will only come because there is social pressure, I believe, uh, can be easily turned into a lot of very concrete policy proposals and I think we can probably go into that in the in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, now I'd like to welcome Darren O'Rourke who is a Sinn Féin TD and also has a passionate interest in healthcare and access to medicines. Darren are you have you joined us? Hi Susan yeah thanks very Hi, much. Hi how can are you? you? You're okay? very welcome. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. And, and thanks to Access Medicines Ireland for the opportunity to address today's conference. Um, I'm conscious of, of time constraints, so I, I'll make three points if, if I can. The first, I think it's been well made already that the, the system of medicines development is broken. It's not fit for purpose. And actually, I think it's unsustainable on uh, many levels. Others have, have touched on this al already, and it manifests in, in different ways in different places. I think in Ireland, in my experience, uh, the problem most often manifests itself in access to new medicines and expensive high-tech drugs uh, for, for people in need. And we've heard about that standoff we, we get between the health authorities and pharmaceutical companies and patients caught in the middle. I think it, it certainly feels a little bit different for COVID-19. Um, and I would say it's fair to say that there's an expect, expectation out there amongst the general public in Ireland anyway, that a vaccine and any other treatment uh, would be made available to, to everybody and uh, free of charge. And I think that speaks as much to our privilege as it does to the, the, the system itself. At the same time though, I, I would say that there are questions raised publicly in relation to vaccine development research being driven by profit rather than the public good. Um, no more so than, than in the Business Post by, by Aaron Rogan a, a couple of weeks ago, particularly when there's a, a suggestion that we'd be closer to a COVID-19 vaccine if we didn't abandon SARS and MERS and Zika research when the prospect of a profit disappeared. And we've also seen access barriers to testing um, related to intellectual property and trade secrets and, and proprietary issues. And uh, Killian de Gaskin mentioned as much in, in Ireland and uh, Ellen Tone earlier on mentioned uh, the, the Dutch experience. The second point I'd make, and if, I think it has been made similarly, um, is that the COVID-19 pandemic is a fundamental shock to the system and it will create uh, new ways of living and new ways of doing things. Um, people have made the comparison with the Spanish flu or with the with World War I or World War II. And we know that out of those seismic historical events that new ways of living and new ways of doing things were established. Um, these are really tough times for people and, and I know that. Um, but in recent weeks, we, we have seen new forms of social solidarity emerging and re-emerging both, both online and offline. Um, we've seen measures implemented that um, I thought I'd never see, to be honest. Uh, in Ireland alone, we've nationalised healthcare and childcare, mm -hmm. we've frozen rents and we've banned evictions for, for, for however long. Um, I think central to all of that is a new recognition of our interdependence, um, the very connected nature of society, uh, not only in Ireland, but across the world. Um, and that stands in, in stark contrast to the kind of rampant individualism that we might have been uh, 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 experiencing before. And, and it, I think it presents an opportunity for, for positive change. I think we should be conscious that if there's an opportunity for positive change, there's also an opportunity for negative change. So for, for those uh, who seek reform, uh, who, who want to see increased oversight or transparency or accountability, who want to see return on public investment, uh, for those who, who want to advance 
alternative models for uh, for medicines development, collaborative, collaborative model, model, model. Um, model. There are also those people who think we should go the other way. We should decrease regulation. We should pay earlier and pay more. Um, and I, I would, I think it's been mentioned already before, I think there are very serious questions over European solidarity at this time and actually the, the future of the, the European Union and the Eurozone and uh, 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 and I suppose everything that, that Donald Trump says is, uh, is deeply concerning. Um, the third and final point I'd make is that system reform is possible, but it will require political will. And I think in these discussions, we have to have an eye on power and the way it's wielded and exercised. We have to, to look at what's said, but also what's left unsaid. Um, in the, the, the pharmaceutical industry and, and medicines development and the types of negotiations and, and deals that are done, there's too much that happens behind closed doors. There's too much left unknown and unanswered, hidden behind a, behind a veil of commercial sensitivity. There are too many black boxes. And I know Emily O'Reilly mentioned about shining the light on the, the black box of the, the EMA. Um, and I, for one, uh, think that we need to hear directly from the pharmaceutical industry in relation to this. And, and I know many people believe that they will continue to have a very important role in the time ahead. But... Uh, I, I think we need to create spaces where we can have real and open conversations. As it stands in Ireland, as, as the same as elsewhere, we have secret discussions and secret agreements with the pharmaceutical industry, um, the latest uh, uh, version of, of which in Ireland is due later this year. Um, we have significant state funding of research and we have considerable room in that for increased transparency and accountability and return on, on public investment. And of course, in Ireland, we have one of the most generous tax regimes on the planet. So I conclude by saying that the change is possible. There's no doubt about it. And um, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks. Um, but I'd say that in, in terms of the pharmaceutical industry and medicines development, the status quo is, is very dominant. So it will require political will. Um, our political leaders have to believe that change is needed, and I'm not convinced that all of them do, and that they have to pursue it. And if the, the institutions or policy levers um, that they have at their disposal aren't strong enough, well, then we need to augment them or create new ones. Um, I think uh, out of our conversation this morning, uh, for a start, the Irish government should advocate and advance international cooperation at a European level through the Beneluxi Agreement. We should opt in where we opted out on the trips flexibility and we should play our part in advancing the, the international COVID patent pool. Um, I would say... Okay, Darren, I'm, I'm sorry Ireland, to, but we're just, we're running over. So I'm going to have to ask you to, to wrap up if you don't mind, sorry. Perfect. Last point is that Ireland has lots of experience in uh, offering new democratic tools and ways for, for bringing different and dispersed disperse opinions to the table and actually uh, thrashing out for the common good. So we, we have a role to play here. Great, Darren, thank you very much for that contribution. Um, now our final uh, panelist today, Dermot MacDonald is going to give an address now. Dermot's going to chat for about five minutes and then we're going to open up to a panel discussion. And as I said earlier, we would really welcome questions from any of you who have tuned in or are watching uh, the conference here this morning. Dermot, you're very welcome, thank you. And Dermot, as I said earlier, is head of Just Treatment, um, an organization that is based in the UK and has done a lot of really excellent work recently, most notably with Orkambi. Thanks, Dermot. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everybody. Um, good to be with you this afternoon. I'm gonna to try to share my screen and see if that's working for you. That is working, it to is, well, it was, right. yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, and just to talk through a little bit, basically, as quickly as we can um, around this issue, and, and trying to put the, uh, to an extent some of the failings that we're seeing with the current response to COVID-19 to some broader societal challenges that we're facing. Um, as as uh, was said by Susan, um, Just Treatment is a patient-led organisation in the UK. We work with people whose health has been impacted by um, the uh, lack of availability of highly priced medicines and the um, negative impact of the pharmaceutical business model on, on health systems within the UK. Um, and what we're seeing really with, um, with COVID-19 is, is 
an amplification and a clarification of some of those really uh, problematic aspects of the current system. Um, one of the things that I think is a really interesting uh, way to view this current epidemic um, or pandemic is uh, this quote from um, Thomas Snowden, who, who's written a book basically about the interaction between epidemics and our societal structures. And he really what he's saying is that, um, you know, viruses like um, COVID-19 or uh, the coronavirus we're facing now and the pandemics that they cause exploit existing failures within our societal structures. So they, they basically uh, prey upon the vulnerabilities that we have created and, and actually lay bare the priorities that we have uh, determined for the well-being of people within our society. And so that is reflected in, in what we're seeing um, in the way that COVID-19 is impacting our economies um, and highlights our vulnerabilities and shows that we've got, um, I'm just double checking, we've got some, um, oh yeah, chats coming through that, um, making sure they're not directed at me. So really it, um, it highlights where we have failed to prioritize the well-being of our citizens basically and the structure of our economy and society. Uh, one of the things that I think is really clear about this is that, um, you know, we knew this pandemic was coming. We had SARS in 2002, we had MERS in uh, 2012. We knew the coronaviruses were a risk. Um, uh, we didn't know when it would come. We didn't know exactly the nature of the, um, of the virus uh, or the way that it would impact upon our bodies or our uh, healthcare systems. We knew that we had to be ready for it coming at some stage. And I think there's been lots of warnings that were ignored about this. And I think one of the most clear areas is um, we missed some opportunities to be further along in the development of um, treatments and vaccines than we could have been. So uh, this guy, very smiley face, Pete, Dr. Peter Hotez, uh, works in Texas uh, Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. He gave evidence at the start of March to a Senate hearing in the US about um, uh, the development of potential treatments and vaccines for cor the coronavirus. And he said in his evidence, listen, in the end, industry is not interested in investing in a vaccine which they would have to stockpile. No one wants to invest in a product designed not to be used. And that's a fundamental failing. We have designed a system of incentivizing the development of new medicines that society needs that fundamentally fails to deliver them, um, and particularly in cases like this where we have a pandemic um, and that is causing devastating effects to societies and economies around the world. Um, and, you know, we had a little bit of chat earlier on about like, you know, uh, communism never delivers um, um, innovative medicines. Actually, the entire system of developing uh, medicines in our Western capitalist societies is highly socialized with huge amounts of state and public funding underpinning it. The studies done that there wasn't a single new drug that was approved by for use in the, U, in the US from 2010 to 2016 that didn't have significant NIH, the National Institute of Health US government funding behind it. For coronavirus, we, from 2002, research by public citizens says there was 700 million or more investment that came from the US government on coronavirus research. Um, at the same time, the four biggest vaccine producers, and Ellen may have spoken to this earlier on, I missed her presentation, but last year alone, they made 30 billion on selling us vaccines. The premise being that that generates research to be invested into the future vaccines that we need as a society, according to the theory of how this model should work. But actually, in reality, last year, we only had six clinical trials for coronavirus um, treatments or vaccines in operation, all of them with uh, significant public funds. So the current system really is um, failing to deliver on us. And we haven't, uh, you know, um, Dr. Hotez is um, had a potential vaccine candidate for a SARS, uh, this is known as by some as a SARS-2 um, uh, virus. Uh, in 2016, his public funding took him to that late stage where he needed to get additional investment um, to take it through later stage clinical trials. And normally that investment, according to our current model, should come from the private sector and it wasn't forthcoming because it didn't see money to be made there. And so we could have been further ahead in what we've done, but we aren't. As I said before, we've got huge levels of investment from, from public sector in, these, um, in this research. Um, but despite that investment, we've got no or uh, very, very few safeguards in place to guarantee pricing that's fair or access that's, um, that's globally and equitable, uh, equitably enabled. Um, so we really have seen with um, 
the pharmaceutical innovation model, a very, very clear failure to, to prepare our societies and our healthcare systems for this coming pandemic, despite the fact we had real concern that it was coming, despite the fact our public sectors were trying to invest to develop those models. We didn't see it coming through the, as a result of the very high prices we're, being, uh, we're having to pay for medicines that is theoretically the underpinning of the current model. And, and this is just one aspect of how, as I said earlier on, this pandemic is revealing the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our societies. We have underfunding and privatization of health systems. We are working with cancer and cystic fibrosis patients right now, who as a result of the fact that we have over 100,000 vacancies within the NHS, when we were coming into this crisis, uh, patients are uh, losing access to cancer treatment. People are getting diagnoses of cancer and are not able to start the treatment that they need. Cystic fibrosis patients who could have had, should have been having uh, additional treatment and care um, are not getting it any longer. And um, so it's, a result of that underfunding and under prioritization of health and well-being that's, um, that's being exploited by this virus. Uh, others have spoken about the global supply chains with little national control or capacity and very nationalistic responses to this crisis. We're seeing the consequences of a very uh, economic system that fundamentally um, makes work incredibly precarious with very fragile social safety nets, a crisis of homelessness uh, and a climate change fueling economy, all making our societies more vulnerable to the crisis crisis that we're facing right now. So how do we rebuild stronger, which we all agree needs to happen? How do we rebuild with more equity, which suddenly everyone realizes that actually it is really important that everybody's got an equal chance of life, that somehow we didn't notice that before now, and the calls for the actions that we uh, knew that would have protected us better didn't come. Um, and weren't heeded before. Now people agree that they're important, that they need to be addressed. And how do we design an economic system that values life and dignity? Well, Dear Mud, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to rush you, but I'm just a little conscious of time because I want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to have to get this you. This is to... my last point, Susan. So Perfect. this is the end no thing. Problem. So how do we do that? It's through collaboration, through solidarity and accountability, not through competition and profiteering. And the most simple way we can initialize that is with support for the World Health Organization. Um, uh, COVID technologies pool, which has been proposed by Costa Rica and supported by Tedros, the uh, current director general of the WHO. Cesar. Thank you very much, Dermot, and um, that, thanks for that presentation. Now, I have a couple of uh, couple of early questions, and I'd like to go to Lord David Chigi of the Liberal Democrats, who's joined us. Um, he has a question that we're going to put to our different panelists. Um, is Lord Chigi with us? Yes, indeed, I am. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I, I'm the chap who's been in your top left hand corner throughout. I feel like the spectre at the feast watching the, what's been going on. <laughs> but I've been delighted to be with you. And thank you so much for giving me this chance. My interest is on in the developing world. I've held posts in our, our parliament for 25 years in that area. And, and I lead on Africa for our all party group. So uh, just after the end of the, or perhaps the containment, of the Ebola crisis, which I'm sure you will remember, back in 2015, we produced a, a, a substantial report of an inquiry we made, uh, including uh, help from Dr. Nabarro, who you'll remember was the UN Special Envoy at the time. And the report was on lessons for, from Ebola-affected communities being prepared for future health crises. And if you remember uh, Guinea and in Africa, Conakry, Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia were three of the countries which were most affected, all of which I, I know fairly well from my previous work as a, a consulting engineer. Now, the findings of our, our report, and I think this is where it gets important, is that the initial response to the Ebola outbreak uh, from international aid and international governments un was undermined by lack of trust, fueled by the spread of misinformation and the lack of communication between the initial responders and the affected communities. Um, and we recommended that the early, early community engagement and mobilization should be led by trusted community leaders, absolutely essential. And the avoidance of authoritarian responses and this dismissal of, uh, of local concerns and social factors was essential. Uh, just quickly, you will be aware, those of you who worked in, in, in these areas, that um, public health facilities in the rural areas is very limited and mainly provided by by village practitioners who rely on traditional medicine it's not through ignorance it's through lack of money 
buy into Western style medicine provided in the, the central parts of these countries and their administration. And this lack of investment in, in modern healthcare is really vital. So what we're looking for in our report was programs developed incorporating community engagement, focused and supported by the international, the international community. Um, and my real question to you now, if I may, is what actions are being taken in the lead up to, to the corona disaster by governments um, and international actors and community leaders to support the dissemination of accurate information on COVID-19? And what actions to support existing health facilities in affected committees are being seen and our programs being prioritized, which put community ownership and mobilization at the center of the fight against COVID-19. And just to finish, um, if I may, uh, in 2018, Ebola, uh, Ebola outbreaks started again in the Eastern DRC and the distrust, distrust and misinformation and suspicion sparked violence against health workers, which led to the spreading of the virus and while it was temporarily uh, uh, suspended. Uh, at the moment, to finish, COVID-19 is spreading in Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia, just like uh, Ebola did, and all three countries are now in lockdown. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. I might put that question to, to Gail and Dermot, because we have quite a big panel, and I am keen to take questions from other people. So would you be able to, to address that question, if possible? I can. I can try to say something. <laughs> I, I want to, the, the question of, uh, so accurate information, it's a, uh, so I live in France, for instance, uh, you know, we've been told for many weeks that, uh, you know, having access to masks was not really an issue. We needed to keep them for the, for the, you know, health workers, but not really useful for the general population. Of course, you know, several weeks after that, and it's the same with diagnostic and tests, we people realize that the reason why we've been said that is actually more because, you know, we are lacking the capacity to be able to provide that to everybody. So we're cheating with, you know, with the information and, and, and we are using medical, supposedly medical knowledge to orientate uh, behavior. So... That's why I think we are in a very important time because this is when we can realize, I mean, be honest with, you know, what are the constraints? And as somebody was saying, not pretend that's a, a policy that is rationing or doing triage uh, uh, between, between um, patients is medically, you know, uh, backed up, but, you know, we, we are under economic stress because there were decisions that were made. And now one very other important aspect is a lot of R&D effort has been done now. Access to the information, to the result, to the data is very key, key so that we know exactly what kind of uh, tool can have what kind of effects and you know whether it's useful, whether there are side effects and so on. And that's another area around, you know, in the in the pharmaceutical economy where there is a lot of opacity and la lack of access to to, to real uh, information. Thank you, dear so, but it's, it's for everybody for you know the countries where MSF works and the and and the wealthiest countries. Thank you very much. Dermot, could I ask you to come in on that topic as well? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Lord Gigi, I, and uh, for all the work that you do. Um, I think one of the things that was interesting, I've read a little bit around how the Ebola response improved in West Africa when the relationships and the um, interventions were informed by the actions of the community. So um, really taking nice. steps that uh, were not completely imposed from the outside world, but were like um, ensuring that uh, local customs and culture um, and, um, and lessons were being learned uh, from, from communities and, and the way that they managed health within their community to, to steer yeah. the response. And I think that's really critical in how we do it, that we ensure we're being, um, I guess, um, really conscious of the interaction of um, our own societal weaknesses, our own cultural uh, norms and practices in designing how we respond to these pandemics is as true in, in Ghana or, or Sierra Leone as it is in, in, in England or Ireland. Um, and so I think that's really, really critical. I think part of that is, has to be about, I think the lessons that um, Gail talked about as well in terms of improving communication. And I think we've got a lot to be said, you know, I think there've been 
well, the, you know, the very troubling news about the health of the Prime Minister in the UK at the moment is also the source of some level of um, confusion and, 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 and question marks about communication around that. And I think in these moments of crisis, I think the need for us to have a really effective civil society um, that has got independent voice that can hold government to account, uh, a really effective media that's properly resourced, that's able to hold government to account and to communicate um, like uh, truth and to call out um, a, a, a non-factual basis and to interrogate the, the kind of the role of all the other key actors in this is really, really critical to us being effective in how we cope with it. Because uh, I think in, in times like this, the, the vacuum of information um, um, basically, it can be devastating and can lead to um, can lead to people losing their lives. Thank you very much, Dermot. Thank you for that. Um, now, I believe we also have Oliver O'Connor, who is chief executive of the Irish Pharmaceutical Healthcare Association, um, who, who has joined us as well. IFA, uh, as they're known, and many of you will know them, um, represents the. The R and D or the, the the research based pharma companies um, here in Ireland. Oliver, you're very welcome. I believe you have a question for the panel. Well, thanks, Susan. Yeah, I, I first of all thank you to the panel for your insights and your comments and uh, offering your perspectives on these things. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that look, this is obviously a time for collaboration and deep collaboration between industry and governments and indeed state authorities, um, in nationally and particularly for us, I suppose, in Europe. And we, have, we are engaging in that at every aspect of the uh, pharmaceutical value chain, be it on the research side through initiatives like Innovative Medicines Initiative, which is a publicly private funded um, uh, call for funding, through, right through to the operational uh, challenges of uh, making sure medicines are supplied uh, throughout Europe through the EMA and through national authorities like the HPRA, where there's a an intensive uh, engagement between industry and uh, authorities to, to ensure that uh, medicines do get supplied, even in very challenging circumstances, and where some national measures have been put in place which could disrupt the supply fairly across Europe. So um, so just some just a couple of comments David, for, for, for uh, uh, Darren, uh, congratulations on your election as TD. Uh, we were pleased, in fact, to have a discussion there a couple of weeks ago before the lockdown with uh, Louisa Riley's office on what might come next for a new agreement on re uh, reimbursement and supply in Ireland. This is obviously on our agenda. And just to come to the point, um, you know, there are medicines that go through in a very tough and strict evaluation process. That should be the case. And it should not be the case that there's an automatic approval for every medicine that's put forward. Um, and that, that, while patients are waiting for that, it can be very frustrating. Um, the situation we've encountered is that you can go through that process, medicines have gone through it, and there are subsequently bilateral negotiations between the companies and the state. And indeed, you come, they've come to a point where there is an agreement between the HSE and the companies on um, the pricing and the terms and conditions for the medicines, and then they're still not made available. And this is the case for over about 10, 12, 13 medicines at the moment, some of which have been approved since last summer. And it's simply because no funding has been made available. So in thinking about this situation, we have said, right, there's no point in, in uh, there's no point in just cursing the darkness. We've got to come forward with a co-funding model whereby between the savings that the industry gives up and price changes and price cuts, which happen every year in Ireland and uh, rebates and so on and so forth, that situation where a medicine can be clinically desirable and approved in terms of in terms of conditions for funding can actually result in it being available to patients. And that's the challenge for the new uh, agreement that we want to meet and we're prepared to meet when, you know, when the COVID emergency is sort of over. Um, <clears throat> the COVID emergency, lots of interesting points have been made this morning. Look, there will be continuing to be a debate about, um, you know, the economics of healthcare, the economics of medicines, the economics of intellectual property rights, and so on and so forth. I don't expect there to be total agreement on that ever, but really at this stage, um, we we are in a joint effort to discover uh, both cures, you know, prophylactic treatment, treatments for medicines for the disease when people get it, and indeed the vaccines. And um, the interesting statistics mentioned this morning, Luke O'Neill mentioned 41 companies involved in this effort globally. 
100, I believe it's 140 experimental drug treatments and vaccines in development at the moment being considered. And now two, 254 clinical trials of relevance to COVID-19 treatment or vaccines. So the mobilization internationally is huge and really it's going to continue on a public private basis. And that gets, that's about particular details nationally and, and indeed with our European authorities. So that's what I see continuing. Um, I hope that panelists will uh, be able to will sort of see the value in that and will be, you know, see that there is, we have to give, there is hope and there's a way we can come out of, not just in terms of treatments for people and reducing the incidence of this uh, virus infection, but but also to make sure that what comes out of this is a, is a system where innovation does become available to our societies as fast as we want and in a way which doesn't put at risk uh, the, the funding sources for that. So thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, and I'm just going to go back to the go back to the panel now. And actually, I'd like to put a question to, to Darren first. And if I could just remind everybody on the panel that if when some when someone else is talking, if there's any background noise on your in the room that you're in or even on your computer, unfortunately it shows up and causes a bit of problems um, on the line. So if you could just be aware of that. We all do have a mute button, um, so you, you can mute if, you, if, if you're not talking for a short period. Just don't forget to, to put the mute or to, to, to turn it off when you're looking to talk again. Darren, you mentioned um, when you were speaking earlier about a lack of transparency around the deal that the state has with the pharmaceutical sector. Could you expand on that a little bit? Because, I mean, one thing that we do see is um, that the state does tell us that it gives us an average of about you know of prices in a basket across Europe it tells us what the discounts are once uh, medicines go off patent etc so what, what would you like to see in terms of transparency so so some um, I suppose it's worth pointing out that um, the, the minute that deal was agreed that it was contested publicly in the media um, the figures that were coming out of it um, and it's been contested ever ever since. Um, we know that the, the government in the run up to, to renegotiations are um, have created open policy forums um, and have had uh, open discussions, but those open discussions, despite the name, um, happen in camera and we, we don't have access to them even when we submit parliamentary questions uh, for, for, for information in relation to, to them. Um, what I, I think there are some fundamental uh, criteria in terms of transparency and accountability and uh, we would like to see, uh, for example, the, the the, the uh, funding that has been provided by the state, the return on public investment, and, um, and the extent to which um, we will have access to, to, to new and high-tech drugs. I think a, a, a significant point um, in relation to this um, is, the, is the nature of the, the negotiation that's going on now. And, and Oliver O'Connor is right, and I'm aware of that, that there is no funding this year for, for, for high-tech drugs. But as I see that, it's a, a very public negotiation in the run-up to the, to the new agreement. And it's completely unsatisfactory uh, from, from the patient's perspective, uh, because many drugs have gone through the, the, the system, have been agreed in principle, um, and a number of the conditions have, that have been put down, and those conditions relate to savings that should be made through the use of biosimilars. But I, I see all of that as symptomatic as, of a, a system that, 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 that doesn't work and do, doesn't serve anybody well. And you know, if, if we look at it in terms of who is really benefiting from it, outside of a small number of really, really wealthy uh, biopharmaceutical companies, that nobody else is benefit from, benefiting from it, in my opinion. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. I'd like to bring Kay in there on that question as well. Kay, are, are, are you with us? Would you be able to address that question? A bit funny. So I don't What I will say is that um, from the patient point of view, there is always um, that grasp of hope towards something that is innovative. But um, the word innovative gets thrown around a lot. And really nothing, nothing is innovative if 
the patient can't access it. it. It's worthless to us. And at the moment, we are finding that there are long delays in accessing any new treatments in Ireland. Um, be, and it's not just in cancer. Really, we've seen this has been building with a number of years and the situation is really untenable because going forward, it, it is the patients who are the ones that are suffering from these delays. Um, and I, I am very fearful for what will happen post COVID-19 because at the moment, of course, naturally our focus is on, on this crisis, but we all know that there is very likely a deep recession um, going to follow on from this. Um, you know, we are the patients who are vulnerable at the moment and the ones who are waiting for these treatments. We really feel like um, we are going to be the ones that are going to be the collateral damage in all of this once it's over, because the focus has been turned, turned away from us and the funding is going towards COVID-19. I just jump in and say, I make a quick point, which is, is I, I, I totally agree with you, Kay. And, I, and just to emphasize, like, Ireland is not unique in facing that yeah. challenge. Like, right the way across every Western healthcare system, there are challenges around the prices of medicines. And um, really, like, the solution is not, it will not be with just paying the prices that are mm -hmm. currently being set. It has to involve the prices dropping. Um, yeah. I come back maybe to one other point that um, Oliver made. I think I would, I would totally welcome the the kind of the mobilisation that's happening now in response to, to COVID-19. It's it's exactly what should be happening and it should be welcome. But it, I'd also caution to say that um, some of that is very reactive in how it happened. And I think the industry's first instinct, uh, and, and this is some of your own members as well, Oliver, uh, work really hard to strip any access and affordability clauses out of the large US bill that went through Congress in response to COVID-19 um, that could have safeguarded access and affordability of those technologies, uh, but it was uh, uh, successfully lobbied uh, for them to be removed by your, uh, by your members um, uh, in a bill that actually unlocked billions of dollars in subsidies uh, for, for research around COVID-19. Um, and it's only really, I think, when uh, there was public pressure in response to Gilead's efforts to tighten its monopoly control over its uh, remdesivir uh, technology, there was only public uh, response to that effort to tighten the monopoly that they relented and, and backed off. So I think we are going to see uh, hopefully a better relationship and a fair um, response from industry um, in response to this, but I think that will only come through significant public pressure for change. Could I just ask, because I have a number of questions through um, that have come in from people who have tuned in. In a recent interview, the CMO, Chief Medical Officer of Johnson & Johnson, said that they are planning a $10 per unit price tag for a possible vaccine against COVID-19. And um, the person who, who submitted this question has asked, what is MSF's view as this price, as a of this price as a benchmark? And I'd also like to ask, you know, in addition to Gail Kaporian, um, Lord Chidgy, if he's still with us, to perhaps comment on that. Dr. Kerkorian? Oh, have we lost Dr. Kerkorian? Perhaps we have. Sorry, sorry, can you just repeat the two last Absolutely, sentence? no, no problem, no problem. So in a recent interview, this Chief Medical Officer of Johnson & Johnson said that they were planning a $10 unit price for a possible vaccine against COVID-19. <clears throat> and the questioner has asked what MSF's view is of that price as a benchmark. And after you, I was hoping to maybe get Lord okay. Chidgy's perspective. Yeah, I'm still here. Well, Thank you. you. Well, you know, uh, MSF is not a pricing agency. So what we are saying about in this example, as in others, is that the best way to have a fair price is to have access to all data about what it costs to develop the product to produce the product and to supply the product. And that's where, and that's where I would hope that with, with the industry, we see fit at some point. We need uh, transparency from the very beginning of the R&D chain that is about, you know, who is contributing uh, to the very end of the chain, you know, and at all, at all steps to know what exactly does it cost and how to make, you know, of course, how to make the, the, the the, the R&D and the production sustainable uh, in the long run also, because you don't want to you know, run into problems after two, two years, but then also make sure it is a price that is affordable by, by everybody. 
And so we sometimes, unfortunately, I mean, we use the data. Uh, Andrew Hill was presenting, you know, extremely interesting data in the first session where, you know, it gives you an idea of, you know, what is the cost of production? What is the cost of production with a reasonable profit on it? It's not our job to set the price, but what we would like to see is fair condition of negotiation with the industry. And again, the only way to do that is full transparency. Thank you, Lloyd. Including you... On, on the cost of trials. Um, Lloyd Chichi, could I invite you to, to, to give your perspective? Yes, yeah, sure. I'm okay. Um, I can't really comment on the machinations between um, factors in the pharmaceutical industry, but but what I can talk about maybe is more general in in, in the cost factors in in regard to rural communities in the developing world, which is where my expertise lies. Um, and it's not just cost of vaccines; it, it's actually the provision of healthcare in the round. Um, a few years ago, um, I think it's through the Africa Union. Uh, it was decided and agreed by African states that they would contribute from their, their, their national finances uh, a minimum of 15% of their GDP, the provision of health care. Um, I don't think that's happened, uh, but certainly in the way I've been working over the years in, in, in remote communities, um, the level of income in real terms uh, is far, far less than it's required to support, for example, vaccines at $10 a time. That isn't gonna happen. Um, and we need to look at it in the round, as I say, of how we provide uh, international aid and investment to raise the level of healthcare uh, in, the, in the rural communities, which affect millions of people, uh, so, so that they can transmit, uh, trans, transmit or transfer uh, into modern approach to healthcare, and rather than have to rely on traditional remedies, some of which, of course, work, but others don't. Uh, and uh, this is this is a real problem. I mean, it's very easy for us to sort of dismiss, in a way, the problems that occur in these communities thousands of miles away. But the impact on the world economy comes back to pick us in the backside, if you like, because we're all involved here, and our economy is global. And, and if we ignore these issues, uh, we ignore them in our peril. Thank you. I'd like to, to put another question to, to the panel. Um, and someone has said, there might be loads of hopes for a change of the systems and um, the existing systems, but equally so much potential for disappointment. Is this hype that we're seeing right now about a dramatic shift in respect of the power, power structure between you know, government um, and the pharmaceutical sector, or will COVID really change the market? Um, and what actual concrete measures are we seeing governments take? Um, Dermot, I, I might put that question to you first and then perhaps go to our, our patient advocates, um, Kay and Jackie after that. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you will have read um, uh, Naomi Klein's book, um, the shock doctrine, which kind of highlighted that big political and economic change can often happen in moments of heightened crises where the kind of normal rules of how decisions are made or politics functions uh, are suspended for a time because of a because of a crisis scenario and it, and I think what we are seeing is we're going to see an accelerated pace of change in some of the ways that global governance is conducted some of the ways that societies are are, are ordered and economies are are um, yeah are are, are organized which we're seeing already. I think it's about the question is really is um, uh, who who is able to um, I guess exploit this um, crisis um, as effectively as they can to 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 shape the the outcomes and shape the aftermath of it. Um, I think what we're seeing right now is uh, a very clear crystallization of lots of the problems that our societies already had um, and some of the responses that governments are taking whether that's about you know underwriting um, private sector firms uh, wage bills or whether it's about the suspension of um, of of 
mortgages or rents or the ending of um, um, evictions from homes. Like there are lots of things which wouldn't happen in normal times, which are having to be taken right now is to, to cope with this uh, crisis. Um, and if they aren't acceptable in the time of COVID-19, how can those things be acceptable in normal times? Um, whenever we are able to be more, um, I suppose, uh, measured in the decision-making that we're taking. Uh, and so what we're seeing with uh, COVID-19 is a number of governments around the world trying to tackle some of the failings of the system right now. It, I think it's been mentioned already that Israel has is, um, uh, issued or uh, threatened compulsory licensing to suspend monopolies uh, in order to get fair pricing of the technologies that are needed for COVID-19. And other governments have made it easier for that to happen, including Canada and uh, Germany and, uh, and others. I think that's something which um, it's been revealed is actually something that's really essential for our, us, uh, for our healthcare systems. And that should be continued after that. Um, and I think the kind of collaboration which is being proposed with the WHO um, uh, technologies pool for COVID uh, is another one which kind of highlights really in these moments, uh, this kind of collaboration is what is going to get us through and the kind of individualistic or competition based responses that we've got at the moment are really fall short of what society requires. So uh, I think this all comes back to how well, um, I guess, patients and uh, um, medical practitioners and society in general can hold their politicians to account uh, in, in terms of prioritising their views over the views and interests of, of industry in particular. Kay and Jackie, would you like to come in on that question? Sorry, sorry, I was just amusing. Yeah, um, I have a couple of points. I think it's fascinating um, and very commendable um, at a number of levels how quickly, say, in an Irish context, we have shifted hugely in society across a number of levels. It's quite fascinating how quickly we have managed to facilitate people to, you know, st stay at home, stay safe hand washing, that public social media campaign, how we've all pulled together at that. I also think one of the things, many, many more people are becoming more informed, more questioning, more willing to ask questions. And I think that's good that the public is taking more ownership about becoming informed and trying to learn and understand what is happening out there. Of course, not everyone is going to understand the intricacies of clinical trials. And some people, you know, even the discussions about the race to find um, a vaccine, you know, even when I talk to friends or others, people are fascinated that you'd be talking about at least maybe up to two years for this. Some people think, oh, can we not find a magic pill on the shelf like within four weeks and when you explain to them the, the process and the correct processes around the rigorous and the very stage of clinical trials and R&D development and the, the investment that goes into that people then begin to appreciate it so I think they're really good and I think this is a time that we should never forget that as long as we keep bringing all the voices and all the players together in an open transparent way where there's no more hidden conversations behind closed doors, I think it'll be a far better society and outcome for everybody. Would anybody else like to weigh in on that question before I go to the final question today? Could, could I come in on that? No. Actually, do you know, Darren, I might come to you afterwards. And Kay, if I if, if you start first, I think it was Darren, um, I'll, I'll come to you afterwards if that's okay. Just as a patient, I've been I'm um, very surprised about how quickly systems have been able to change, you know, systems that were considered very archaic and unbendable. Um, from my point of view, even something as simple as being able to get an appointment um, with my own GP who understands my condition, it would normally have taken me a week and a half to get to see my own GP. But um, I found in the last couple of weeks that I can actually have a teleconsultation with her within 20 minutes of running, bringing the practice, which is a huge uh, bonus in, <laughs> in my eyes. And I would hope that we would learn from these, um, this going forward that things can be done differently. Also in relation to A&E and the trolley crisis, I understand that new protocols are being examined as a result of how this has um, all played out and how the a &E has been effectively cleared out um, and that hopefully we won't see us going back to a situation where we have 600 plus people waiting on any given day for a bed in our hospital system. 
Thank you. Darren? Uh, and I would agree with a lot of those points that, that have been made. I think uh, central to it, um, to answer the question, I think it can go either way here um, and that the future is, is up for grabs and, and for ours to, to create and to influence. Um, uh, politics plays out in the middle of all of that, the, the competing interests, the, the complementary interest i think there's a, an interesting question to be to to be asked in relation to you know why does it take a, a global pandemic to for these institutions and for the pharmaceutical industry and for for politics to work the way it is now um and some of that is because the light has been shone on 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 these practices and i think it's about continuing to to continue to to, to shine the light on it and, and try and uh, hold those in positions of, of power to account. And Darren, we're, we're coming close to uh, to, 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 to one o'clock um, and I, I don't want to, to go over it this morning, but an, an interesting question came in and it was in respect of something that Louise O'Reilly recently put forward. Um, Louise O'Reilly, for just, just in case, uh, those, for those of you who don't know her, is Sinn Féin's health spokeswoman and obviously you know a colleague of Darren's in that party. And she called for a compulsory license for COVID diagnostics. How seriously do you think the Doyle will take this as a potential step? And just for, for those of us who, those who might be tuning in internationally, the Doyle is our equivalent to, to, to your parliament. How, how seriously do you think it will be taken? Yeah, so, so she didn't actually call for, for a compulsory license to be issued. What she called for, was for all options to be considered and i think within that uh, all options within trips flexibilities i think we're well, in, i presume uh, that with, would be that would include a compulsory license oh it, would oh, it, it, it does oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. so, so rather, yeah. rather than so just to be clear in relation to it, it wasn't called for options. a compulsory Don't it was you. it was calling for all options including okay. including compulsory license to to be considered and i think that's entirely appropriate um given the, the, the circumstances we are we're in the trips flexibilities are there uh, they have been used elsewhere in the in the world um including in in britain um we haven't used them in, in ireland but we 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 believe that they should be on the menu of options okay thank you very much look we're, we're our time is up unfortunately um i'd like to thank all of our panelists who joined us this morning and or earlier this morning i should say and just now uh, to Kay, to Darren, to Jackie, to Gail and to Dermot, thank you so much. Um, I now want to hand over to Susie Geiger um, from Access to Medicines Ireland, who is going to wrap up uh, today's conference. Thanks to all of you who tuned in and joined us and it's most especially <coughs> to those of you who submitted questions to the panel. They were much, or to the panels this morning, they were much appreciated. From me, Susan Mitchell, thank you very much. Hello everybody, I'm a full professor at the UCD from Redford School of Business and a leader of an EU funded research project uh, looking into market failures in healthcare and digital health. More importantly for today, I'm a member of Access to Medicines Ireland and on behalf of this group, I wanted to thank you all for participating in today's web conference. I particularly wanted to thank all the speakers and Susan Mitchell specifically as the moderator, she's done a fantastic job. Uh, for sharing their expertise and views with us. I think it's fair to say that we all learned a great deal over the last three hours. You might know that today is World Health Day and that we had initially intended to run a full day conference, which would have been the fourth in a series of AMI conferences around issues of access to medicines, run on this day for the past four years. This year, given the very peculiar circumstances that the world finds itself in, we had to postpone our live conference, which will happen later in the year, and um, we had to recourse, uh, uh, resort to this format, which I think uh, went very, very well, uh, technology um, head up. Uh, we, of course, very much hope that you will join us for the real live event and uh, that we get to talk to you all again. The many social, ethical and policy issues surrounding the current COVID-19 crisis that we heard so much about over the last three hours are an acute symptom of a global healthcare system that is deeply entangled with markets and profits, and not always for the better. The issues that have been highlighted in relation to COVID-19 today have been replicating themselves in multiple other disease categories. And often, as we heard, patients are left suffering. But as we also heard today, there are chinks of light that this system is in fact changing, changing very rapidly. 
Um, with open source research and development gaining rapid ground, both in PPE and ventilators, for instance, actually here in uh, Ireland, there's countries, uh, there's companies working on that. Um, we see an interest in broadening equal access to healthcare for all exploding in the media. We see a willingness of all stakeholders now looking to collaborate and a greater adoption of digital health tools, including teleconsultations, as um, Kay mentioned. At the same time, we're seeing some troubling developments as well in the loosening of people's digital privacy, for instance, and we have to keep a very close eye on that. So let's hope that by the time we meet uh, in real life at our main conference later in the year, we can see real developments in medical and pharmaceutical innovation and commercial practice, and we can discern what was a hype and what's here to stay and transform the system for the better. As AMI, we certainly will not stop campaigning for a fair healthcare system for all, together with our European and international partner organizations. And I want to again mention the, the issue of global health and global solidarity here and the need for it. We want, do want to point out that there will be a new framework agreement negotiated between the pharmaceutical industry and the Irish government later this year. So hopefully the lessons will have been learned. We've also just last, uh, last week written a letter to all Irish research organizations to include pro-public safeguards and affordability clauses into any research funding for COVID. And we believe this should be standard practice for any public research funding. Please stay in touch with AMI on Twitter or Facebook. Join us at our monthly meetings every third Wednesday at 6 p.m. Normally in Koloff, uh, at the moment we're on Zoom, of course, and we're looking forward to meeting you all in late 2020, when we can perhaps look beyond the enormous personal and economic costs uh, of COVID for so many and um, concentrate on the good that the crisis might have brought uh, to the awareness of how vital healthcare access for all is for now. Have a good day wherever you are and stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks all. All the best. Thanks. It's great to see Good you on the screen. Good to see you. Yeah. Take care. All the best. Bye. Take care.